It's like a pizza crunch without the butter Karen Boyd, comedian, actor, a pint-sized patter merchant with a shot of spirituality and a big fat ADHD patsy of a man. <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome you back to the patter poofy for your hat trick. My guests love you, I love you. What's been happening, bro? Well, pleasure to be back here, man. It's a lovely intro, thank you. It was good, wasn't it? I just accurate. wrote it like five minutes ago. Really? No, Aye, mate. no thank you. Um, man, all sorts been happening for the last time I was on. A real... Journey, man, a real miles away. As I was saying, I think the last time we spoke was like during or just about lockdown. So coming out of that, the roller coaster to get to here has been unbelievable. And I'm sure as we get in and settle in, I'll, I'll tell you all about it. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the last time when we spoke, you were, because don't get me wrong, like, knowing yourself, every time I see you on social media that you're always doing something new you're, you're dead you're dead uh, you're very adventurous well that's I a can, good way to describe it uh, uh, it's, some may say like hyperactive uh, man but adventurous well, many, many different variations of the mm. same thing but you're always you're always doing something you're never feel what it looks like on a social media perspective you're never bored nah. you're never shy of something to do but I think the last podcast and I think I might have still been on the tag when we done that podcast so that was a fair while ago it's feeling familiar yeah yeah so I think you were talking about how you'd kind of comedy had became a bit mm. of a stalemate for you. Totally. So what has happened is, uh, is your attitude still the same in regards to that? What's happening with there? So what I've discovered recently, and this is before we did the podcast, but what I found recently is I basically made like my name known in stand up. Didn't it become a name, but more people knew my name because uh -huh. I'd been doing stand up and I'd been doing comedy. Right. And I'd found that. At the same time that I was doing all these shows and gaining all this experience and developing the stand-up, there was all these other things that were coming just for being a comedian. People wanted you to come on shows, people wanted you to do this project, people wanted you to give a speak just because you were a comedian. Give a speak. Do you hear that there, man? Give Let me come speak. and give you a speak. <laughs> Amazing. <People laughs> pay me for that. Unbelievable. <laughs> so the two of them were happening at the same time. And then what happened was... As the two of them were rising, these things became more interesting than the actual comedy did. Right. So the comedy, I kept going back because I was like, I'm a comedian and that's what I do. And if you're a comedian, you do comedy. And I kept going back and the gigs were getting less and less um, fulfilling. But I was, the work was still the same. The audiences wouldn't have noticed anything different other than the ones where I was dying on my ass. But they'd always been consistent throughout uh -huh. the comedy career. But the ones that I was having really good um, success and where I was leaving and people were saying well done and that was the way I measured success was how the other people view you. Uh, external val validation. Total, totally. And I was getting all that but internally something was missing and something was lacking. And when I was doing the gigs that went badly as in nobody was laughing, you're up there, you're dying and the gigs were having like a prolonged like time-lapsed effect on me. So during it, I'd be like, oh, this is all right, it's just a game. And then weeks later, I would be like, oh, fuck, why did I say that? Why did I, yeah, why did yeah. I say that? But just about like a gig in Paisley. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm seven people in the room and I'm like, ah! And I was like, the the levels here on the balance and the cost that this is costing me isn't adding up, but it's because I was, I was focusing too much on what the audience needed. That was my whole thing. Mm -hmm, do, mm -hmm. do, do you like me? Do you like me? You're laughing. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll do a wee dance for you. You're laughing. And that was exhausting. It's exhausting because it wasn't authentic. Uh -huh. so, um, uh, so it was, it was kind of that, that kind of, you were writing your content or writing your material mm -hmm. for the audience rather than for yourself with an audience watching. Completely. And that's, that's hack. That's literally the definition of hack. It's somebody who does their stuff for an audience. They don't do it for themselves. There's no internal art coming in. So for that... I realised, right, I can't keep doing this. I just can't keep doing this. I need to do something else, but I couldn't figure out what to do. I tried about everything. Like, we done a, a podcast, an unreleased podcast. Oh, uh -huh. by the way, sorry, sidetrack. Shout out to my uncle Craig, who since I done that podcast with you, where I was the interviewer, I was the five -o, and you were the me. Yeah. He has been saying, release the podcast, release the podcast, and I haven't. So, Craig, where's the camera? Craig, there's one for you here as actual podcast Craig. with five -o. Park your van right, man. I can't get out. 
some moments. <laughs> <laughs> so see, see the podcast, how mm. many did you record in total? Um, I would say my hard drive's got about 15 podcasts that is a combination of guests, and it's not the one podcast, it's a different podcast every time. So one podcast was a review series, one podcast was called Season 3, Episode 3, where I got a guest in, and we watched Season 3, Episode 3, a show to see if it was good. Right. I got one with you, I right. get interviews with other people, I get ones that are just me talking, I get ones, like the ones you do, well, it's just you in the chair. Uh -huh. That was the inspiration for them. I was like, I'll try oh, my own. How did you get on? Uh, How did it feel, should I say? Did it feel right? Didn't they feel None right? None of them felt right. None of them felt right. Not a single one of the projects that I launched off felt authentic. It felt like I was actually getting the fulfilment that I was looking for. Right, so they okay. all got abandoned. Every single one Are of they them. They still out there somewhere? No, they never they never went out. No, I mean out there, is it on your hard drive? I got them on a hard drive, man. What's the plan today with them? Are they never going to see the light of day? Ah, they'll probably get put in the documentary, man. Uh, either right, okay, either okay. for the success or for my mother. Either way, they'll get in the documentary <laughs> and you'll be able to show them. But, um, I so eventually, um, this is actually really ties into what I want to talk to you about later on. But the biggest issue I was having was direction. Life direction. Mm -hmm. Sense of direction. With the idea where they go. Just kind of out in no man's land? Completely. But with a strong desire to be doing the work so i remember being 10 years old and watching big brother with mm -hmm. my mom right. and probably and i probably shouldn't have been up that late now that i look at it but you know how they come out and the the geordie commentator says so a guy coming out and he was like this is julian julian is i don't do access but i was like he was like julian is uh, the bad narrator the big I, brother narrator back the original guy he was like uh Julian started his own business when he was 14 years old. It's one of the Welsh Geordies, man. But he's, Day four in the Big Brother house. That guy. That's what I can do. I haven't even got to try it. Right, so he said, uh, he said that Julian started his own business for when he was 14. And I remember being 10 and going, fuck, I've only got four years to get it together. I need to find what, what we're going to do now. So since the age of 10, that desire to be then the work that is fulfilling has been there and it was that same desire that's been there all through teenage years or through right. acting or through starting the comedy all the way up to now and um, it'll come back later on. Uh -huh. Tune in. Uh -huh. I like it, I like oh. it. So see, it's that kind of thing where, as you say, you tried the podcasting, you've tried, you've done the comedy, you went in a kind of different tangent with the comedy because mm. I remember when we last spoke, I think you were getting back into comedy but it wasn't a comedy, a stand-up as mm. such, it was... Short stories? Or no short stories, it was a story spoken word. stuff. Storytelling stuff, it did, they didn't come with that? I had another one. So, um, it was another kind of quote-unquote failed project, but no really. Right. So, I've got my show coming up in March, which is my kind of big foray back in a stand-up. I've been running about on the circuit doing wee practice bits and that. Right. But what I found was, is that the five or ten minutes that I was getting when I was on stage just wasn't enough for me. It didn't interest me. You t you're sending me out there for five minutes. It takes me five minutes to tell them what my name is. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And you're meant to come in and go, here's me, here's my joke. Boop -a -doo, boop -a -doo, boop -a -doo. And I thought the further up you progressed, the more you would just get and get. But it seemed to be 10, 15 was the like, slot I was kind of stuck in. And it just wasn't long enough. So I thought I'll do some storytelling so I can get a bit longer. So I went. I was an incredible storyteller. Shona, who actually put me in for a gig in the Scottish Storytelling Centre. And I remembered them because I was signed up to their newsletter. And it would always come in. And for about a year and a half, it was like, Scottish Storytelling Centre, update, update. And every time I seen it, I was like, I'm going to do that one day. I was like, I'm going to do a gig in there. And Shona came to me and she was like, I think I actually got in touch with her to ask, how do you be a storyteller? Which... It's my number one bit of advice. See anything you want to do, contact somebody who's doing it and just be like, hi, I want to do this. Could you help me? I've done that a hundred times and I've found mentors, I've found pals, I've found paths. Best way to do it. So I messaged Shona, can you help me? And she was like, I got a gig in Edinburgh, come and do it. So I've done the gig in Edinburgh and it wasn't a stand up this time. Before when it was stand up, I had the mask, I had the character that I had mm, created. Yeah. I'm, I'm witty, I'm fucking mental, my dad's an Arab. <laughs> So that, was, <laughs> so that was safe, that was safe there. When I done the storytelling, it was all vulnerability, man. The mask was gone and they could see my fucking soft, mushy heart underneath. And I was telling a story about how my ma had cancer when I was growing up, about how my dad left, about how my ma's strength and experience like fed into me being the person I am today. And my ma was there, she was running late. She's like, oh, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. And she wasn't there for the first half of the show. I'd done my, my wee story. She wasn't there. And then I was doing the second half, the cancer story. And she walked in just as it was about to start. And I was like, oh, this is a story in itself. But there was an issue. And the issue was is that I hadn't been used 
to exposing myself. I hadn't been used to unmasking, both in a comedic sense, but also in a neurodivergent sense. So you, you heard the masking for ADHD people and autistic people? I'm not too familiar, mate, no, if you can explain it. It basically just means that, like, um, for people with autism and ADHD and all sorts of other three-letter, four-letter things, we basically want to be like this. Oh, screw, oh, screw, oh, what do I need to do today? What do I need? All right, I'm going to need to, I need to, I need to brush your flares now. I'm going to, huh? You can't do that in public because people hang your meds, so you need to just sit like that with a mask on. So, would that almost be like a kind of equivalent of intrusive thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I, I like intrusive thoughts, but um, on a more natural level. Right. So, the way an intrusive thought is like, ah. It's just that kind of natural. The way that I describe it is, it's like when you're walking about steaming or on the whack as tobacco, if you're walking about in public, you can walk about going, but the police are just there, there. So you better square yourself up so you go, all right, hold on. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And if you're officer, getting an event, you're like, all right, act sober for the security. Can totally. I? Right, so okay, underneath, okay. you're still like, Ooh, uh-huh. but you mask, you put a mask on. Right, right, right. Okay, I get it. Neurodivergent people are doing that all the time. They okay. always go a wee mask on. And I don't even know what it was. I've been doing it for t- a decade before I even knew what it was. So I've been used to masking. But when I was in Edinburgh, when I was in the storytelling centre, when I was doing this really emotional piece, I didn't have any mask on. And this whole audience was looking at me. And How big was the audience? Um, maybe like 90 people. Really? Yeah, hey? it was in a wee theatre Was that space. the first time you'd ever done anything of this kind of magnitude where, um, where you exposed yourself as such? It was the first time that I'd ever done it as me. I'd done it as the character before. I'd done it in the performative state, but I'd never done, here's the hard emotional truths in my childhood. Here's the, the pain that I didn't even know that I'd went through until I started writing this story. So too much came out and I wasn't able to control it and I also wasn't used to it. So what happened was my brain went, oh, this is already, you're embarrassed by this. This is an embarrassing time for you. And what that was doing was protecting me because I wasn't ready to handle that level of emotion. So even though it went really well, and my mom came up, she was like, I love you, son. People coming up at the end was like, oh, I'm mixed race as well. Your story really resonated with me. All the external validation was there, but internally, my brain and my body was like, you've done too much. You've showed too much of yourself. So then I shied away for the storytelling as well. And then it's only new coming in a year, gone through a lot of experiences, getting to where I'm, that... I'm ready to tell my story, but in like a controlled way, if that makes sense. Right, so see when you say a controlled way, do you mean like in a comedic manner, where you can rehearse it as like a, a 10 minutes or a 20 minute set? To an extent, I'm, uh, that's why I'm doing the longer shows, because I need that full run. I've been doing um, public speaking gigs, and I've also done a few comedy sets where I've just ran out. I was meant to do 20 minutes, and I've done 40. A couple really, times, eh? A couple times now, sorry. sorry. Oh, Dad put a few noises at a joint there? No, the audiences were all good, and oh, the really, comedians eh? were what all good. What about the comedians? Like? They're all good, because it's these, these the stories that I'm telling is my experimentation with psychedelic medicine and plant medicine over the decades, so they usually have this kind of unbelievable like high and low format to them so uh-huh. when i'm doing that people are usually like whoa but the big thing is a lot of times they're only laughing the way they used to and that for me was a huge learning thing because it showed me that the reason that stand-up was leaving me cold is that i was not interested in the punchline i'm not interested in going bang 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 and having a whole place laughing i like making people laugh it's part of my way that i speak but i'm not walking towards a laugh here i'm mm. walking towards a story i'm walking right. towards a truth that i've found that i want to share with you and that's why stand up wasn't working as much because uh-huh. the day 10 minutes wasn't long enough to mm. get them on the whole journey uh-huh. i suppose because if you look at like i'm not saying this is true for every comedian but you can understand why some people might get addicted to the laughter mm-hmm. where you're just trying to get that that feel good like because it's great you tell a joke you go up, you tell it, and everybody the fucking room are up. So it's one of the best feelings you can get. King of battle. It's like, it's, uh, it can be external validation. Mm. But plus as well, it's like something you've worked hard on. Mm. You're, you're getting that immediate that immediate feedback. Obviously. But see, whereas before, maybe that's, I don't know if that's what you were getting for comedy to start with, where you were you're getting the laughter. Definitely. So see, when you're saying, no, it's about telling the story, mm. what is it you're getting back for that, if no, the immediate external validation? What is it you're getting now that is filling that void? The... Closest way I can describe it is it's something in people's eyes when I'm doing the the when I'm up there and I'm conducting the energy and I'm I like that's pure mad way to say it but I like to think that like painting with words so it's like you can you need I need a wee bit of red here or too much red get a bit of blue and as you're telling the story you can see this and as I'm doing that I can see people they look 
and they've got like a kind of, it's similar to, if you've ever seen somebody on uh, mushrooms or acids and their eyes get really big, their pupils get really uh-huh. big and they're like dead black. Aye. It's like that, except there's a wee star in the corner. Oh, so like that, behind their eyes? Aye, it's literally like stars in their eyes. Uh-huh. And I'd never understood that. I always thought it was like an actual five-pointed star. Like, tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be. But no, it's, it, there's an actual twinkle that appears in people's eyes when they're looking at like the magic process taking place. Uh-huh. And that's what I'm up there trying to get and trying to capture. And that's what I always was capturing in the stand-up. My jokes were whatever. For about 10 years, it was just made-up stuff about Arabs and Muslims. I got, I, my first comedy I ever done on the telly, I came out and I was like, look, it's a Muslim letting his own the telly now. That's no, both of the things are not true. One, I'm not a Muslim, and two, Muslims were never not allowed on the telly. So it was a total fabrication. It was a, it was a, an exaggeration of the the things that I thought people found funny about myself. Uh-huh. But it wasn't the magic. It wasn't authentic. But now when I'm up there, I'm going, look, this is me. I love yous. Thank yous for coming. But fuck yous. All I can do is this. This is it. Have you have you found this funny? If you don't, I'm no difference to me. I'm uh-huh. up here trying to do this. Ha. So that's what I'm moving to now. And in March, March 31st, March 31st, uh, Black Friday. March 31st? Easter that's Sunday. my fight. As it is. Same, you'll, be, same you'll, be, day. you'll be at Scrappin and I'll be at Scrappin the audience. Scrappin your emotions. Yeah. Who is it you're fighting? Uh, a guy called Jasper. Jasper. Jasper Fair. Are you on TikTok? Nah, not really. I'm you actually. Know, see, if you're not on TikTok, you'll know any of these cunts, no, man. I know you. Ah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not on TikTok, not on top of it. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, Jasper is uh, he's a guy from Edinburgh. Uh, He's like a TikToker. I don't really know how to describe the cunt. He's got like eight wings. <laughs> aye. I don't know if he's bringing them. don't know if I see That'll probably be his backup. Yeah. But aye, so he's just another fucking asshole in the canvas. That's, <laughs> that's the way I look at it. Not on top of it. I'm going to paint him yeah. like Da Vinci. No, that's cool. I'll still not know who he is even after you knock him out. Aye. Exactly. And he'll not know who he is <laughs> after he gets knocked out. Not on top of it. <laughs> Class. So see, when you talk about... You mentioned that uh, your journey through plant medicine. Mm-hmm. So... You spoke to me lately about how you had an experience with ayahuasca. You want it? You want the full shibazo? I want the full shibazo, right, okay. mate. Okay, let's get settled down for this. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get a water on that. So, the reason that I wanted to do this podcast is that you and me are like the newspaper. Like, rather than going to like the Sun or the Daily Mirror, I'm like, I'll go to Five O because Five O is how to get in touch with people in the schemes. Because like when it. I do your podcast, people come up and go, Soon on Five O, but and then they could talk about things. So, as soon as I had this ayahuasca experience, I was like, I need to go on Five O. I need to go on Five O. Did ayahuasca podcast. tell you to come on this podcast? I was, it was so, ugh, I can't, I can't, I'll get to that, I'll get there. It comes, it comes back at the I end. I wish you said I because it just like, ayahuasca made me go to premeditated part. Well, it was, my thing. it was after, it was after the yeah, ayahuasca. Right, right, so, right, right. It, there's we'll a Alaska had something to do with it. Well, they, 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 <laughs> there's a period called integration where it kind of puts stuff together. Oh, and as I was, right, right, after right. I'd been through it and I was going through the integration process, it was giving me bullet points of stuff today. It was like, go here, do this, go here, do this, go here, do this. Right. And this was one of them. Okay, it was okay. like, go to five. Right, let, let me hear the story, man. Let, let me hear right. the juice. So, if you don't know what ayahuasca is, it is made for the roots of two trees and they mix it together and they make it into like a dark purple liquid and it, it, you can think of it as a drug but it does a total disservice to what it can do the they, people in the jungles and in the tribes they call it medicine yeah. it's proper medicine and they might take these two vines mix it together make stuff now they've been using this for fucking centuries they know all about it. They've got it down to a tea. They've got shamans. It's passed down for grandfathers to grandsons, for mothers to daughters. It's came all down this lineage. And my dad actually took ayahuasca in Oman, I think it was. And he had an experience where he got to speak to the medicine. And he was like, what are you? And the medicine was like, I am from a line of jungle women who heal people through history. And then it showed the lineage. It was like, Brrr all the way down to like the ayahuasca and it's like and this is how you connect with us with these jungle medicine healers you take this and then you get in touch with us and this is before I took it I was like wow that sounds pretty cool man let's get it a go but I'd found out about this when I was like 14 because I'd always knew something was up I'd always knew something was off internally I think a lot of us feel that it could be mm-hmm. neurodiversity it could be whatever but I knew something wasn't right and I thought I would have to fly to Peru to go and take ayahuasca and they always said I always remember reading up it says Mama Ayahuasca calls to you. You don't need to go and get her. Uh-huh. She calls to you. Uh-huh. And then through my good pal, Sanch, who's a music producer, I'm actually going to his tonight, uh, he introduced me to a group of people. And then one of these people messaged me and was like, hey, bro, do you want to do the Ayahuasca ceremony next month? And I was like, if that's no the call, do you know what I mean? I got a WhatsApp message, fed a man, asked me if I wanted to do it. I was like, that's going to be the call. And I was like, 
let's do it. So this was January. This was kicking off the year. And I was like, fine, let's rumble. And one of the guys that I met was called Senor Dragon. Mr. Dragon. Senor right? Dragon? Senor Dragon, bro. He's Spanish. As soon as I met him, I was like, you're my people, man. You're the guy. You are the, I was like, you are the boy. And he it was Mr. Dragon that had messed me like, do you want I was like, let's go. So we set the date. Paid, I got a, 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 like, um, a discount on it, which to me was ideal because one of the things I think is going to be uh, an impediment to people getting to this is that it's super expensive. Uh, no, and, it's quite dear. And people are charging it. high prices and that. And I, if I hadn't uh, been able to have the the beautiful chance to do this, I would never have been able to do it because it was just out my price range. It was uh -huh. just too much. So that something will come to me. Ring fast, where have you done it? Um, or what country? I've done it in an office block in Postal. What? In Postal. you done it in Postal. I've done it in Postal. I thought I was going to need to go to Peru. I thought I was going to need to go to Mexico. I done it to Postal. I done it to Postal. Postal. And right. they flew a shaman for the Brazilian jungles to Postal. And to did he fly the medicine in with him? He, he did. He did. Because I hear it's like, see the medicine, mm. like, people, where they grow it, or obviously where they, whatever they mm. do, they take it and they make it up. It's mm. like they seal it in these containers and mm. it needs to be protected because uh, it can be open to energy to get into it. Somebody actually told me about that. Like, if it's made in the wrong way, it can fuck you up. So that's the shaman that came here. He had to go into the jungle before he was able to come and travel because he's traveling the world now doing these ceremonies right. but before that he had to go into the jungle and there was called the diet of silence where he was allowed to drink a bit of water and eat at nine in the morning and that was it the rest of the day he just had to be there and the reason he was out there in the jungle was to strengthen his spirit so that he was able to go around the world and do these healing ceremonies because he's there he's got a guitar and a drum and that. Well, he's, he's, right? he's playing the whole night and he is he's controlling the energy all these people and all these different locations are. so to do that he had to go through intense training in the jungle before he even got to Pozo, do you know what I mean? I was trying to say, it. I was like, <laughs> a different type of jungle. Yeah. So, um, we so before it, we need to go on a diet, very specific diet. Um, you can have tobacco, can have alcohol, can have sugar, can have caffeine, can have meat, can have dairy, just all this stuff. What so, did you have? Um, a lot of rice, a lot of tofu, a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruit, a lot of herbal teas. Um, yeah. it was quite shy towards the end, but I felt really good. Because the reason is uh, you need to get the body all nice and clear to be mm. able to do it. Because it has a, an internal physical effect on you. And uh, you can, there's this, what's called purging, which is either like, and this is where everybody gets thrown off, man. But when you're in the, the process, yeah, a small part of it is that you will vomit or you need to go to the toilet. You don't like shit yourself in the room. My partner thought that we were all going to be sitting a bit whitey and shitting ourselves. And she's like, why are you paying for this? Why are you? And I was like, no, no. It's just, but what it is, is like, it's cleansing the body and getting stuff out and cleaning. Uh, I've heard of that before as well. It's like, if you're, if you're eating all the kind of wrong things and that, the, the ayahuasca will go to work in that first. Yeah. So it's idea is to cleanse your body of all that stuff so it can get to the root cause of what have you What's going down? So I felt very light even getting there. So I was driving in and the days ticked by before what? Because I'd been waiting for years to do this. I couldn't wait to do it. So I went and ticking, ticking, ticking and I was like, Jesus Christ. Eventually it came, I was driving there and it felt like I was dying. I felt like I was going to my death, like to the gallows. I was, it felt, really? like, felt like the end of my life. Everything was flashing before me. All the people that I'd known, all the people that I loved, all the bad experiences, I had good experiences. I, honestly, it felt like death was coming and I was like, what's the final? No song I'm going to listen to before I die. I was like a hero by Enrique Iglesias. Oh, like, what a song, man. I'm driving what up a to, way to go. Up towards Springburn, like, I can be a hero. <laughs> like, kill me, kill me now. So we get there and we go up into, into this, like, um, the, the area that it was in was just really closed off. So there was, we were in a space, but there was nobody around about us. Right. Thank fuck, because it got pretty wild up in there. It got crazy later on. But we, we come in and we're all sitting. Everybody's got a bedroll. There's about 12 people. And there's people at all ages, young people, people in their, like, 60s. There's all sorts of different people. One of the gals I was with had never taken a psychedelic in her life. Some other people had, had wee experiences. Other people, everybody had a reason to be there. And we were all so different. It was so I go in, we get our bedrolls done, and a shaman comes out, man. He's got like the kind of black long dress on, and he's got a big feather on his head, man. A big, oh, big red it. feather, and two wee green ones at the side, and then hundreds of wee ones running about wearing a wee feather crown. And I was like, this guy, he knows what he's up to, man. He knows what he's doing. So, okay, uh, the, the shaman is translator, and the shaman was called Juan. And we didn't know his translator's name, so we were calling her Juana. So we had Juan, Juana, uh, Senor Dragon, and one of my amigos, and then uh, all the other people that were, were doing the, the ceremony. Okay. So we go in, and we're sitting there. There's some cool hangs up on the walls. It looks lovely. And we all go around, and everybody goes, what do you want for this? One person's dealing with grief. One person wants uh, understanding of who they are. One person wants to let go of a past event. All this different stuff. It gets to me, and I'm like, 
I want to know what to do for work. Just like we were talking about earlier. So much of my life has been chasing a direction. I'm going to be an actor. No, I don't actually like acting. I'm going to be a stand-up. Oh, stand-up's too hard. I'm going to be a writer. I hate writing. I'm going to do a podcast. Too much work. Forever and ever, just every week like that, just these new... And I was like, just ayahuasca, tell me. I was like, tell me where it is I'm supposed to do. Please. And I thought this was going to take the whole two days. So that was my intent. Wrote it in my pocket. What do I do for my life's work? Bang. In the pocket. Good to go. So then we go around and we all take it and we get the medicine just in like a wee Starbucks espresso cup sort of situation. I don't know what I expected. I expected something more mystical. But <laughs> nah, just a wee paper cup. We all go around and everybody gets it and it oh, smells weird. And it's dark purple and oh, it's a bit bogging. So we get it and he's like, uh, they keep saying all these phrases in like Spanish and Portuguese and it's just like, I don't know what it was, but it was like, yo, bro, 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 hold on tight. I was like, hold on tight. <laughs> I was like, here we go. So I drink the medicine, bang, and we're all just sitting in silence, man. Everybody just chilling. And it's brutal. Because as I went to get it, I, the shaman pulled hunters in. And then Senor Dragon was like, no, no, he is on medication. And then he put hunters back out. And I was like, oh. I was like, bro, I'm not on medication. I was like, if I want to clean the house quicker, I'll like pop an ADHD med, but I'm no pure beholden to the med, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was like, this isn't going to work, man. He's not giving me enough. So we go around, about 15 minutes pass, and some people are getting a bit wavy. And some people are going, <coughs> and I was like, this isn't working for me. I'm not feeling nothing, man. And, and uh, as before, I would like to caveat, before I tell this, please, if you're listening to this, remember that one of the great joys in my life has been psychedelic experimentation. I've wanted to see how far out you can go. When I was in my early 20s, I heard the term psychonaut. And I love that, the idea that, like, you don't need to go to space. The astronaut will go to space and then tell you what it's like. You don't need to go. You can just chill. I had that same feeling with plant medicines. I was like, I'll go and see what can be done and I'll report back. Mm -hmm. So I've gone into this experience. I had lots of previous attempts to get the healing and get to the place. So we're going around and we get the medicine and I'm sitting and I'm like, this isn't working. And I go, I go up to Dragon. I'm like, Dragon, bro, this isn't working for me. Like, I've not had enough, like, please. And he was like, hermano, hermano, shh. And he lies me down on my mat, takes me back, sets me down. And then he goes, <laughs> obviously much better than that, but he was <laughs> dead something. And I was lying there and I was like, what, what is this, man? What's going on? And then it went like, and it activated the medicine. I felt it. I was like, whoa, whoa. I was like, whoa. And then one of the big things I went through was doubt. I doubt, as we were going to run, uh, Dragon was like, I am a medicine musician. And all the scheme in me came out. I was like, medicine musician? I was like, get a trade, son. I was like, <laughs> you're not going to make money with a musical medicine. And I was like, give me the way. I was like, this isn't going to work. And then, bloop, doubt overcome. I was like, let's go. So, as everybody starts going through it, and everybody has a different reaction to it. And reaction isn't the right word. Everybody has a different interaction with it. Right. So, what had happened is there was a gal who was up the back who later on in the night would be gone like blah, 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 blah. I can't recreate but where's the people that took the medicine? Yeah, so every day in there took the medicine. Yeah, okay. And uh, what I thought was is that she was being weird and we were all being sound. What I later found out was me and her were being weird and everybody else was being sound. I didn't realise, but they, what had happened as soon as the medicine kicked in. I was like, oh, what's happening here, man? What's going on? And I had a blanket with my shoulders. And I was like, I love this blanket. I love this blanket. And the space that the medicine took you to is very similar to the space that mushrooms take you to, that LSD take you to. It's like the same place. The difference being is that this is like a lot more centered and you can feel it a lot more. And also you've got the shaman now. His whole job is to control the energy in the room. Right. It's not like you're at a gaff. Full of mushies, like, oh, ah, there's oh. mad fucking trippy tunes coming on Let, the daily and yeah, that freak you. Trippy visuals on YouTube, do you know <laughs> what I mean? There's a man here whose grandda was a 102 year old chairman who taught him all the secrets of the medicine so that he can go and heal people's spirits. So that's what the, the, the interaction was. So he's there on the guitar, and I get this wee blanket run, and I go to the blanket, and then I go like this, and I go, Hoo! with my head down like that, and I get stuck. I can't move. I'm stuck doing here like this. I'm stuck here for about 10 minutes and the medicine can speak to you. The way the medicine speaks to you is in your own thoughts. Uh -huh. So, for example, there was a bit during the night, I was like, oh, <laughs> what do I do? Medicine, what do I do? And the medicine was like, in my voice, in my head like that, just breathe. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <sighs> oh, cheers medicine, thank you. So I was like, the medicine could talk to you. And when I was stuck, the medicine was like, you're no getting out until you let go. And I was like, let go of what? 
And that's when it opened the door. It was like, bang. It took me right back to my childhood pains. It took me right back to all the suffering that I'd felt as a kid. It was like it was like I was six again playing around the fields. And um, when I was younger, my best pal was my cousin. And we used to hang about. But we ended up losing touch as adults. Partly just because you get older and you disappear. But also partly because I came out. And when we were younger, we were taught that gays are weird. And you don't talk to gays. So when I was one of them, we were like, what do we do now? So we just kind of naturally grew partly apart. And I thought, as an adult, I was like, I'm sound with it. That's just what happens. But the ayahuasca was like, nah, this is killing you. You've been holding on to this. Let go. And I was like, oh, my cousin. I was like, oh, I love you. So, oh, why do we don't hang about? Ah, sorry, I didn't see your wings grow up. Ah. Letting all these sounds out. Uh, one of the lasses told me that she thought there was a wild animal in the room. Are I'm you actually just, making these noises? I am in, oh, I'm in with my head gone. Uh, uh, uh. No, obviously they don't know nothing about my cousin, man. Uh. They can just hear all these noises coming from me. And there was a woman on the wall, like sitting like a photo, a uh, woman meditating. And I looked at her and her face became my cousin's face. And he was looking at me and he was like, and I was like, I love you, bro. I was like, I love you. I was like, because what I did with my willy, we don't hang about. I was like, that's crazy. That's crazy. So that was just, that was the first part of it. And this was, it takes a lot. It took a lot. It was exhausting. And I was like, I love you. I love you. I love you so much. And it was all coming out. And I was just lying there, man. And I had this wee egg. And all I could do was shake this wee egg. And I was just lying on the ground. The sham was like, rumbe, 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 rum. And I was just lying under my wee blanket. Fuck that. Like, oh, oh, I can't take any bell, please. And then the shaman was like, would anyone like some more of the medicine? And I was like... Aye, aye, sounds. So I bounced up and I took the second one and that's when it was like, woo! I was like, you wanna, you wanna do healing? Let's do some healing. And I was like, all right. And it just went right. I was still very much in the room. I was still very much centred, but my mind was going to like a different place. And we all the music and stuff that's happening as well. I was really feeling it. And everybody was in a circle in the middle of the room. And I went to go stand in the circle. And as soon as I stood in the circle, all the energy started swirling up for me. And I was like, oh, I'm going to throw up. So I, they gave a wee black bucket with some like plastic in it. And I ran to the bucket. And I was like, blah! But it wasn't like a way to when you're sick or when you're no well. It felt amazing. I was like, it was purging. I uh-huh. was like, I was a purging Mary. I was uh-huh. like, this is amazing. <laughs> I was like, it, it felt like I, everything that had crystallized and hardened inside me and I was throwing up all these crystals. And as it was happening, I was like, go medicine, go. And it looked like crystals. And I was like, get all these crystals. It was beautiful. And then I went to go back to into the circle, but I got caught looking at the window because you're still a bit trippy. You are a bit trippy. I'm looking at the window at Glasgow and I'm like, in my head, I'm writing a poem and I'm like, I love Glasgow. Glasgow is my life. It's in my blood. It's in my belly. Glasgow makes me proud to be Glaswegian and if I could make the most Glaswegian noise I could, it would sound like this. Eh? Eh? But obviously they couldn't hear the poem so all they could see was me standing at the window going, eh? Eh? <laughs> eh? <laughs> like that. So then while I was like, you are right," And I turned around for a toilet roll and all that, man, I'm all out of the place. And I get back in the circle and I'm like, right, come on, focus down. Like, rum bit, rum bit. We all go back to our seats after the song ends. Everybody's like, only joy, only joy. They'll shake me eggs. Only joy, only joy. And we go back to our bits and I end up getting caught with a folding door. Like there was a folding door next to where we were, like a wee screen. And I just kind of get it open. I'm like, uh, 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 my nut. Uh, uh. And the shaman through the translator is like, if everyone can just really concentrate now. And I'm at the door. Eh, eh, I love you, door. I'm sorry, I can't put you to the door. I'm sorry. And the shaman's like, if we can all really concentrate. And I was like, oh, that's for me. And I was like, right, let's get serious. Bang! Opened the door, folded out, went and sat in my bed. And I was like, Whoo. I was like, let's go. So I, had, I knew I had to go internally. So this is just night one. There's two nights of this. I will take a break in between. <laughs> So night one, and then I had my wee bit of paper that said, what did I do with my life's work? And I was like, Mama Ayahuasca, I was like, tell me, what do I do? And it was just like, I can't explain. You need to understand, I've had like, maybe like 15 years of confusion. And it's no like a wee, mm, I'm quite confused. It's a deep, soul-based confusion that I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. It's been my main issue since childhood. I've not been able to solve it. And I was like, Ayahuasca, what did I do? And she was like, bang. She's like, you are supposed to walk with autistic kids to help them see the colours. And I was like, whoa. All right. And it wasn't up here. It wasn't like, all right, cool. I knew it here. When the ayahuasca said that to me, I was like, oh, shit. That is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to walk with neurodivergent kids and help them see colours. Because I've always had, 
hypersensitivity in my eyes. I can see colours differently and I interact with them. And I went to art school and everything, but I was all I was always focused on being a really good draw. I was like, I want to draw good. I want to be a really good draw. And then I forgot all about the colours. But ayahuasca was like, no, 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 forget all that. I was like, work with the kids, show them the colours. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. So we go through it, I take another wee bit of the medicine, I fall asleep, so you fall asleep while you fall asleep, all the things going on. We finish it, we wrap up, and I was like, wow. I was like, we stop and everybody talks. The shaman's knackered, because he's just done a whole night. Uh, that's 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. We've all been up, dead, gone through it. The the one of the women, everything turned to snakes for her for like an hour, so it was a really rough time for her. So everybody else had their own unique, different experience, and we wrapped up, we let it go, and then we moved on to day two. Questions? So see, when it finished after the first day, did mm -hmm. you stay in the building? I stayed in the building. There was 12 on the first day and there was three by the second day. Some of them were meant to go home. A bunch of them chose to go home. They were like, that's enough for me. Thank you very much. Wait, can you just date after one day then, that's you? Yes, you can date one day and then leave. Some of the people were there day ayahuasca regularly. So there's a scene. There's a whole community. Is there? There is. But I've always been dead sceptical about doing it somewhere that isn't in the jungle. So this is my issue. Is like I'm really glad that we had the shaman flowing air. I could date... Patricia and Scott's jungle retreat. Do you know what I mean? Ah. But I just think that like the the shaman that we had, his granda was a hundred and two year old shaman who had died with a big smile on his face. He, like, he said something like he told us a story at four in the morning, and it was deed at four o five with a big smile. So he just done his work all the way up to his death, and he was hundred and two, mm -hmm. and he was death happy. That knowledge cannot be understated. Uh -huh. Like so, I think if I was going to do it again, I'd need there to be some connection to one of the tribes. Aye. I don't know if I want to date with John and Peter. Nah, and mm. I fucked that, man, because it's, as well, I don't get me wrong, there's probably these people that are based here, that are from here, that mm. have the best of intentions, but you need to go to the source. Absolutely. Because as you say, it's like, it's that energy, mm. is that, and it's like, it can only be taught by the line lineage. Mm. And it's, I always, I look, there's actually a fucking, uh, a website called, I think it might be Retreat Finder, mm -hmm. something like that. And it's basically like a fucking just eat for ayahuasca, <laughs> mushroom retreats, ayahuasca retreats. But there's that many. You mm. don't know what one's legit. I remember looking at the, is it Rhythmia? See the one James English done the documentary at? I don't know. No, car, no. What's Rhythmia? So he, uh, Rhythmia is just like the name of the retreat. So oh, right, James you. English done a documentary where he went and drank ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And uh, the retreat was called the Rhythmia. It's basically set up. It's like... It's no like a fucking a spa or something, but yeah. they set it up as like the rhythm retreat. You go to this retreat and they do it. Yeah. But it's a very commercial. Go on, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? So on, yeah. I think it was like five grand or something. <laughs> and uh, I and it is it can be quite pricey, but see the people I sp everybody I speak to about doing it, I've always had it in my head I wanted to go and do it. Mm -hmm. Because I've took DMT. Mm -hmm. I know it's no the same, but it is. The it's same the space. Same, uh, the takes same, you to the same place. Exactly, because even you talk about where well, you were asking it questions, I realised that with DMT mm -hmm. where I would ask it questions and, and that thing in the heat where when we talk about doubt, the very first time I took DMT, I've probably told you this before, mm. I kept getting that thought thing, but it was my own thoughts, mm. but it was them speaking to me mm -hmm. and it was saying doubt is the devil. What? Repeat, doubt is the devil repeatedly. Then uh, <laughs> it was mental. It was like doubt is the devil. And that mm. way I'd been always been full of self-doubt. Wow. And I was like, right, that's... When I let, uh, came out the trip and went mm. away for it, it was still stuck with me. Doubt yeah, the devil. Yeah, that was the devil. You get the wee uh, the nuggets that stick with Yeah, you but I went to see something. My, my pal, he was, uh, at the time, he was in Leverndale. Mm -hmm. He'd, uh, he was, he'd experienced drug and just psychosis, mm -hmm. so he was quite, he was a wee bit away with it. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about God and all that kind of stuff during the visit and mm -hmm. that, man. And at one point he says, doubt is the devil. <laughs> and, I'm like, ah, what the? and everybody that was there was kind of like that, right? And I was like, ah, what? Right. What did he just say to me? And I'm like, ah, aye. And I'm like, ah, it's because... I'm like, how the fuck is he? Doubt is the devil. Mm. I've never read that anywhere. I've <laughs> never seen it in a film. I've never read it in a book. It's nobody's to this day said that to me. <laughs> doubt is the no doubt is bad. Doubt is yeah. doubt is doubt. Doubt is yeah. the devil. It's like, and as the many experiences I had, but mm. don't get me wrong with with the DMD, it's hard to kind of figure out what it actually is. Mm. is and and see to be honest, there's no point in even trying to figure out what it is. Mm. It's, Just it's, let it's it tell you. Yeah. Let yeah. it tell you about you. Don't try and think about what it is or what mm. it came for. If you want to figure it out, fucking ask it. Mm. I remember I thought about scaffolding, how to build scaffolding mm. while whilst I was under DMT and it was like a fucking AI fucking vision of this mm. scaffolding just building itself. Wow. I remember that. I remember so when you talk about asking it things, mm. but I do believe that you have your calling with it mm. and uh, it tells you like and I went through a period I'm like I need to go and do this I need to go and do this but right now I when you're telling me it's like I, I want to go and do it but mm. 
Same time as well. I don't feel the calling just yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was the exact same. I I wanted to and I had this desire to, but it wasn't the time. Uh-huh. It wasn't the time. And there seems to be an inbuilt mechanism in people that is either on the lower end of the scale was like, mm, no, quite yet. And the furthest end of the scale is, no, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. And if you feel like that, don't go there. Aye. Don't. <coughs> <coughs> that's, that's the ayahuasca tell me <laughs> I don't go in there don't go in there that's yeah, what I used to say with the DMT with people when I'm like oh, see most people but like, I'll oh, try it just try mm. it and you do get some people like that I'd be like somebody do you want to try this mm. I'm not too sure leave it then yeah 100%. leave it don't force yourself and uh, I it is it's fucking I know ayahuasca is a lot more interactive mm. whereas DMT is like short sharp intense yeah intensive as fuck yeah it's like a blast it's like been blasted into fucking space and landing with a thud you're like yeah. what just happened there but uh, I'm curious to know what happened in day two so day two as we so a lot of people go hey me and one of the gals we kind of link up and become amigos and we're like we'll kick about there's a wee mini stone hinge out in Springburn way is that a, a big stone in the middle and hundreds of wee stones outside it right so that was some find we were like oh, alright did you find it by accident I just kicking about and then we seen it and we're putting our horns on the stones and we can feel the energy and we're going around different stones and different stones feel different ways. Can you can you feel this one? I mean, we've got our shoes off. People always think we're mental, but that's we're so connected. The medicine's opened us up. We're hypersensitive. Remember we went into Aldi to buy toilet roll and we were like, the fuck what is this man? Everybody with all these bright lights and cues. This is more mental than what we're doing up there. So we ended up we got back and we're only eating soup and fruit and stuff and all this. And it was day two. So on day one. The shaman had been blah, 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 all night and keep not 12 years safe. It was only three years on day two, but it was like the same amount of energy, but just divided by three. Imagine a cake and getting 12 slices out uh-huh. and then having the same cake and getting five slices out and you get so much more cake. It was like that. And um, so we go in and it's night two and we change positions. Everybody swaps about the room. So we are there and they are there. Shaman, translator, dragon amigo. And there's uh, a big window there and a big window there and they're sitting under it. And we just get started. My brain's like, don't do it again. Please don't do it. It was like, it was too much. It was just too much. You've been through too much. Go home. Go home. Rest. But I knew, I was like, oh, no, we need to. I was like, you need to go get past the fear. It's part of every story. Uh-huh. Hero goes, oh, I can't do it. And they go, right, fine, I'll do it. I was like that. Ah. So I went, done it. Second night, bang, goes down. I'm waiting on it. I'm like, oh. there's a pair of eyes on the wall that I'm looking at. Kind of, it's got like green behind it. It's really nice poster. And I'm looking at the eyes and I'm like, eyes. Tell me what to do. Like, tell me what to do. And they're like, don't worry, we're good to go. So I take it, and I'm looking at the eyes about 15 minutes in, and suddenly they look like monkey's eyes, really clearly. Super defined monkey eyes. I, was like, oh, I thought they were like beautiful lady eyes. It turns out that they're monkey eyes. I was like, weird. And then the medicine starts kicking in, and I'm like, oh. Shaman is playing a flute. Playing a beautiful flute. He's going. <whistles> and I was watching him, and I started to cry immediately and I was like holy shit I was like we're in the presence of a master I was like the work that he's doing and the, the things that he knows between the music and the medicine I was like he is a master and as I'm thinking this just greeting away his face is there doing the thing but you ever play Crash Bandicoot when you were a wee guy Aye. you remember the wee tiki mask that would pop up I think it was Aye. called Ooga Booga Aye. it was like that it was like when Crash wears the mask it was like that but it was made of pure light and there was another face in front of his face and I was looking at the face, and the face was a different person, and it was like basically like, "All right, how you doing?" It was like, "I am this guy's granda," and I was like, "Oh, the shaman granda," and he's like, "Yeah, how you doing?" And I was like, well, "Obviously, I'm I'm making it I'm making it sound more streamlined than it was. Aye. A lot of this was just through feeling and thinking, uh-huh. but I was just basically like, "Oh, what, how you doing, man?" Like I was shocked. I was like, "Oh, how how you getting on?" And it was obviously <laughs> that was like, "You must be very proud of your grandson." And it was like, "He's doing what a grandson should do." And I was like, all right. And I was like, what's it like being dead? And he didn't flinch. It was like, it's the exact same as being alive. I was like, really? He's like, it's the exact same as being alive. And I was like, oh, cool. And then he could tell that I was doubting his grandson. It was like, mm, you don't really believe him, do you? And I was like, ah, kind of, man. He's dead, but no, really. And he was like, do you want to test him? And I was like, I think so. And he was like, do you want the power of the monkeys? And I was like, all right, hold on a second, Bill. Let's pause. <laughs> I was like, ah, what? He was like, do you want the power of the monkeys to test my grandson? And I was like, number one, scared. And number two, 
I'm not going to say not his superpowers, man. Mm-hmm. We've seen too many films to know that, like, if somebody comes and offers you superpowers, you say yes. Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? Aye. So I was I was scared and I was nervous, but I was like, give me the power of the monkeys, man. And it was like, okay. And then, boof, I felt Hanuman, the Hindu monkey god, come to me and embody me with the power of the monkeys. And, mate, I swear to God, I transformed. I felt like a cheeky monkey, bro. I went for being me to being like, <laughs> I felt so mischievous, bro. This guy's out there doing the hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. And I'm in my head going like, <laughs> I just try to distract him. And it goes out my head to in my mouth. So I'm out loud going, <laughs> It was like all the autism and Tourette's that I'd repressed in my life came out of the ones. Uh-huh. And in my head, I'm throwing fucking bananas and apples at him. And <laughs> at one point, I'm sure I seen him go, and I'm like, did he just dodge <laughs> that psychic <laughs> apple? I was like, no way. So he's there doing the meds ring, and he's got this rapid, it's like a tobacco, he blows up people's noses, and he's going running, he's doing it. And I'm, I'm sitting in the corner of the room being like, fuck you, man, fuck you, fucking jungle cut, man, you ain't, you know the fucking medicine, bro. I was like, what did they teach you? 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 And he's not looking at me, he's no Britain character. Are you shouting this? I'm screaming at him. <laughs> I was like, what did they teach you? What did they teach you in the jungle? What did they teach you in the jungle? And now and again, He's turning around and he's making eye contact with me, but he's turning around like this and he's gone. We had the biggest smile you've ever seen, and every time he looks eyes with me, my whole facade crumbles. So I'm like, fuck you, you don't know nothing, you don't know nothing, you don't know. And he looks at me and I go, ha 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 ha. Sorry. But as soon as he looks away again, I'm like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, man, fuck you, man. But no, in a hateful way, and I really like loving way and he can tell that I'm trying to stress him out and fuck with him and he just no it's not an inch to him so suddenly I start speaking in tongues it's coming out man I'm sitting there going <laughs> for about an hour and a half I can't even recreate the intensity that came with it but that's I'm going <laughs> and I was like jokes on me I was like the monkeys have got you now I was like Sham is out there chilling and you're fucked now so I went into the toilet and I looked in the mirror and I'm going <laughs> But behind us, I'm like, oh, I feel chill. I was like, this is really cool. I think all the masking that I had done in my life and all the stuff that I'd held back was all coming out. And the one, and it was very powerful. Sorry, were you guys say something? No, I'm not. Right. I'm, I'm engaged. No, okay. it's, uh, I was going to start speaking in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, for, <laughs> for about an hour and a half, man, that it was. Really beautiful and really profound, but also really intense. And I was like, how did I stop this, man? So I was sitting there, and I was looking out and uh, at the window, and I see one solitary star. And I was like, you're beautiful, man, you're beautiful. And the star started talking to me. And I was like, oh, I was like, you're stunning, talking to the star. And the star was like, um, you're me. And I was like, what do you mean, what do you mean, what do you mean, what do you mean? And he's like, you're me. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? What the fuck are you talking about? Having a pure argument with an actual celestial star for about 20 minutes. I'm like, what do you mean I'm you? What do you mean I'm you? And he wouldn't tell me. He was like, ah. he's like, what, you know a star? And I was like, oh, ha ha, very funny. Like a star, like I'm a star, you're a star. I was like, fuck you, man. I've been raging at this star. I was like, tell me what you mean. Tell me what you mean. They wouldn't tell me. I was getting all stressed out. And so on the second night, because I'd found out the work thing on the first night, on the second night, I was like, let's deal with belly stuff. I was like, I've never felt good in my belly. It's no a feeling fat thing or a weight thing. My dad's got a similar thing. It just feels like something in here has always been tight or tense or... A physical thing? Physical thing, an internal thing. Like, for years, for my whole life, basically, I've walked about like this. Like, my belly was out there, I'd walk... Oh, man, big bit of fluff in my belly. you got to leave that in if it doesn't Ah, cheers, I I leave that here, man, a wee souvenir for me. Like that, Usually you bring candles before, man, (laughs) but a bit of belly fluff, if kind of went down and I didn't bring you the Metro so I could... Oh, here we go, man. So for years... Metro and some belly fluff. I would walk about like this. Like that. Held in. Because it felt like... There was something in my belly that was wrong and bad and terrible. So on night two, I was like that to the ayahuasca. I was like, can you help me with this? So I'm going through this whole experience, all the tongues, all the, the shaman and all this stuff. And then I start to feel my belly expand out like this. And it feels like it's getting so big, like huge, uncomfortably big. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so fat. I was like, I'm, I'm so fat. I'm like, I am going to blow up. I'm, like, I'm going to explode. So I shout, Dragon, who at this point is walking about blessing the wall. He's like, standing at the wall going, shh, shh, shh. And I'm, I feel like I'm like the wee woman and the wee lassie and Charlie in the chocolate factory that gets turned into the balloon. Aye. I felt like that. I was, like, I, was like, I was like, dragon, dragon, help. And he comes out and I go to say, I'm, I'm so fat. And he's like, brother, don't worry, I don't even get to fat. I'm like, I'm so fat. And he goes, shh. And he goes, shh, 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 shh. 
And he's like, I will be back in two minutes. And he leaves. And I feel like I'm on my deathbed. I'm lying in the bed with the sheets up here, my belly blowing up. I feel like I'm going to explode. And all I could, the shaman's walking in the middle of the room going, hi you, hi you. And I was like, oh, I could do the room before I die, shake this egg. I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And the shaman seen me. And he was like, what the But he was like, moan. And I was like, me? No, no, I can't. And he was like, moan. And I was like, hi, hi. And I got right up and I stood in the middle of the room and all the energy that was in my belly goes out me and up me and suddenly I'm walking about in the circle with a shaman and translator going Hiya Rambe, Hiya Rambe, Hiya Rambe and this energy is like flowing out of me I can't control it, it's so powerful I'm like Rambe, 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 Rambe I don't really have a say in what's going on I'm just tap off, hat on Hiya, Hiya, Hiya we do all this, we're dancing, we're singing, everybody's on the same level. My pal's in ecstasy, no own ecstasy, some people have thought of it, but in ecstasy. So she's in the corner going, wah, oi, ooh, and I'm running there with the egg, like, Bruh. and she's going, wah, and I was like, what, what is going on in here? This is chaos in here. Eventually I go and I lie down on my bed after the song finishes, and I'm like, wow, I was like, thank God that's me done. And then the dragon gets on the guitar and starts playing like an upbeat song. And I, mate, I honestly, I swear to God, I am levitated out my bed. I'm put into the middle of the room, like, I don't even have a say in it. My body just goes, and I'm in the middle of the room, doing the most exquisite dancing. It doesn't look like this, it looks a lot better than this. But the best dancing you've ever seen in your life, I'm doing horn stones, I'm doing jumps. I've never danced like this before, and I'm knowing my head going left, right, one, two, hand down, foot up. I'm just going, wow. Dragon's playing the guitar, going, hi, bra, 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 bra. And I'm fucking dancing away, and eventually I'm so overwhelmed that I throw myself at his feet, and I'm just getting my wee egg, and I'm just sitting there going <laughs> to the beat, and I was like, oh my god! Eventually he stops the song, and I was like, you are a medicine musician. And I was like, I'm sorry, bro. I was like, you are a medicine musician. And as I'm standing there on the ground, I look up at the woman on the wall who's been talking to me, and she was like, you've turned your back on Islam, and I was like, what? She was like, you've turned your back on Islam. Go lie down. And I was like, oh, fuck. So I go lie down. Is this the eyes? The, uh, no, no, the eyes. The eyes were there. The woman for last night, who uh, I didn't want anything to do with, because I'd uh -huh. seen enough of her last night. Is that the woman that had the face? The face, cousin? absolutely. Right, 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 right. So she, I'd spent all night looking at her, and she was telling me the secret. So I wanted nothing to do with her, but I found myself in front of her again. She was like, you've turned your back on Islam. Go lie down. And I was like, oh, shit. So I go, and I lie down in my bed, and then suddenly I feel the connection to my Muslim ancestors. I can see them in the deserts at like markets and they are able to like talk to me across time and space the same way that the shaman did and they were basically like bro we heard you've got a problem with your belly and I was like it's too big I was like too big always been too big and um, the shaman gave me this crystal which was like um, citrine or something I don't know the, the chakra people don't know but that was to deal with that so I'm just holding on to this crystal and I can hear my ancestors talking to me and they were like look bro they were like see to have a son in our lineage with a full belly. Like, that makes us so proud. Like, we're out here in the desert, scraping by, bro. It's like, we're at these markets just trying to sell shit so we can eat. And you're telling me you've been satiated for you were born. You've had a full belly your whole life. They were like, well done. And suddenly that had a whole internal shift. I was like, oh, thank you. I was like, oh, cheers. Suddenly I was proud of my belly. The most shame I had ever had had all been centered here. But I was so proud of it. I was like, oh, cheers, man, thank you. And they were like, but no, you've turned your back on Islam. And they were like, reconnect to Islam. And I was like, all right. And I was like, before I even got a chance, my body was like, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the only prophet. There's no God but Allah and Muhammad is the only prophet. And now, bro, I ain't caught up with Islam. I've been in the castle milk, man. Nobody's talked to me. I've had no interaction with it. But it was coming at me. I was like, no God but Allah and Muhammad is the only prophet. No God. Horns and knees on the ground. And I was like, no God but Allah. And as I've been going around telling people this story, I've, they've loved all the bit, the shaman, the dancing. I've told them the Islam bit and they've been like, oh. So this shit makes you mental then, eh? <laughs> you know? So, but what I realised there is I was lying in the bed and I was looking at the eyes and the eyes were like, right, I'm going to tell you this now. Are you ready? And I was like, I don't think so. And they were like, right, go get me our medicine. So I went to the shaman and I was like, bro, the medicine told me that I need to get me deep into myself. What did I do? And he was like, look, he's like, if you're too agitated, this isn't going to work. He's like, you need to focus yourself, concentrate yourself. <sighs> Whenever the medicine comes up strong, get your strength. And I was like, all right, okay. So I took it, took a second cup, lay back down, and I went into myself. And I went through 
my life. I saw my own life. I saw the lives of my ancestors. I saw the guys at the markets. I saw a Somalian slave trader who was like old and grey and I felt myself become him. I saw his life go out before me. I felt myself be one of my ancestors who was in the desert. His camel died and he got lost and a woman came and he met the woman and he hated the woman so he started battering her. So the woman became all shy. So he hated her even more. So he strangled her. So he buried her in the sand in the back garden and then died a lonely old man and then they were reborn but they swapped roles. So she was the guy he was the woman she strangled him and they lived this endless cycle and I was caught in this endless cycle I felt my fibres being ripped apart as I couldn't tell where Terry and Boyd was and where all these other people were I screamed I was like ah because I'd lost everything I didn't know where I was my, my fucking strings my DNA was being scattered across time and space and I just had to rely on the medicine I was like help I was like, please help. And I kind of eventually, I get myself back in my body and I can't wait to be myself again. I'm holding on. I'm like, oh, thank fuck. And the medicine was like, look, it was like, I need to tell you this. You're not going to like it too much, but here's what your whole issue was. And then I had gave me a wee song and it was like, I had the egg and it was like, listen to this song. And it was like, you're fat because you're gay. You're fat because you're gay. You're fat because you're gay. And I was like, what? I was like, don't you dare. I was like, how cheeky? It was like, you're fat because you're gay. You're fat. And I was like, what the fuck? And eventually, I'd done that song for so long, it settled in and I realised, I was like, whoa, what had happened was, growing up in Castle Milk and no being connected to my culture and no having an understanding of my sexuality, I internalised Islamophobia and I internalised homophobia. So I hated myself because I was gay and I hated myself because I was Muslim, but I didn't have the words for that yet. I was only like six, so I didn't know. So what I instead did was channel it all here and be able to say in a very childlike way, I hate my belly. I hate my belly. My belly's too big. I don't like my belly. And I thought that I had to get a six pack and I had to work out. But what I was really saying was, I will only be happy when I'm skinny, straight and white. They were my three conditions of worth. These were the things that I had measured myself by my whole life. When I'm skinny, when I'm white and when I'm straight, then I'll be happy. Now look man, I could get a wife and I could get on the keto, but the chances of me being white are very, very slim. <laughs> it's no authentic to who I am. The medicine showed me this. It took me right back to the days in childhood where I was looking at the people around about me and making these associations and it let me heal it. It let me get it all out. And the way that it let me get it out was a wee bit of vomiting, but also sonic vomit. So I was I was um I was so angry before I got this realization, or just right before, I was in the pillar, just screaming, going, ah! At a level I can't even recreate because your neighbours will be like somebody's getting murdered but that properly like, <laughs> like that coming out and I was so angry and I was angry at all the kids that were laughing at me and I fucking hate it and I had to get the, the translator and I was like Juana please help please and like she came out and she's like what's wrong and I was like I'm so angry I don't know what to do and I'd always repress my anger I was a very angry child but I'd get rid of it I didn't really get angry except big meltdowns um, mm. every six months in adulthood uh -huh. and I was like I'm so fucking angry and she was like ask the medicine what to do and I was like medicine what did I do and it was like hands and knees and I got my hands and knees next to the bucket and then I went oh for about three minutes the whole room was filled with a sound. I was like, Aah! and I go to all out. All the feelings of self-hatred, all the feelings of self-disgust, all the feelings of I need to be this, I need to be that. They left, they left with this experience. And by the end of it, don't get me wrong, I was shattered. I, I was lying in bed. I got to speak to Ramdas for a while. I was like, this is crazy. Eventually I fell asleep and we woke up and the night had ended. And I thought, holy shit, that was so much stuff. And they said, right, now you're going to go into integration. The ceremony's only like 10%. Your life's about to change now for the work that we've done here tonight. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy shit. So suddenly I was feeling different. I felt better about myself. I felt more comfortable in my relationship. All these things. But the craziest thing is, remember on night one, when the medicine was like, you're supposed to work with autistic kids to show them the colours? Uh -huh. Two days after I did the ayahuasca ceremony, I got a phone call. And it's a woman who has been introduced to me through my ma. And she's like, hi, uh, look, I want to see if you can uh, do some group work. And I was like, all right, cool. What's group work? She's like, I want you going into schools to be doing art therapy with kids who are having difficulties. Right. And I was like, 
obviously I'm Mahid, I was like, the jungle just told me this was coming. But I was like, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> yes, no, I'll be very proud to do this work. And then it's that, I sit, man. So I'm in and I'm doing art therapy in schools. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going through and I'm showing kids to see the world in a different way for everybody's taught us to see the world. And I'm letting the light come through. I'm letting the colour come through. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. And the difference that I can feel for like, all the stand-up stuff and all that, it was good, but it was a false path. You can have success on a false path, but unless it's what your dharma is, your life's work, your life's task, you never get that fulfillment. And it could be working in WH Smith. It might be. If you're in there and you're like, this is exactly what I'm supposed to do, then go for it. But I'm now feeling a sense of connection to the world and peace that was never there before. And I go to give that all up to the ayahuasca. It's to witness its healing abilities was profound. I felt privileged just to see it in action, just to see how it walked through people and how it healed them. And sorry, I feel like you've got questions, but I've got one. No, I'll keep story. talking. Okay, right. I got one I got one final story to wrap this all up. So I get the feeling that everything's becoming well known. We know that ketamine and psychedelics are having impacts on people with PTSD and depression and they're doing the studies and all that for it. So they're all bringing the, the tribal knowledge out of the West. But here's the issue with that, and it's a story I'll tell you, as there was a scientist who went to the jungle, and he seen a shaman do stuff, he was giving people medicine, and they were getting better, and he was like, holy shit, this is amazing, and he was like, said to the shaman, he was like, can you give me a list of all the ingredients that are in this medicine, and the shaman was like, no bother, gave him the list, the scientist went back home, put all the ingredients together, nothing was happening. Just a dud. Every time he made it, didn't matter how he made it, it was a dud. Guinea people, dud. Shite. So he flew back here to see the shaman, and he was like, can you? Can I just watch you make this to see exactly what you do? And the shaman's like, I ain't bother. So right enough, he gets all the same ingredients, starts putting it all together, and then midway through, he just reaches behind them, picks up a live crab, and drops a crab into the bucket where all the medicine is, and the crab starts swimming a bit. And the scientist's like, oh, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. You didn't mention a fucking crab, bro. And then the shaman is like, you didn't ask. You asked for the ingredients. I was like, I gave you the ingredients. Crab isn't an ingredient. Crab is a crab. Don't be daft. Do you know what I mean? But it turned out that the crab had on it. Its shell had a component that when it mixed with all the rest of the chemicals, activated them. The crab was the catalyst that created the change in the state of the medicine that made it become medicine instead of just being a bunch of ingredients. So what we need to realise is that the way that we think are here, it's just totally different for the way that they think of the, the way we think of medicines and safety and laws and all that stuff. It's literally a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So I, we can go out there and we can get all the ingredients, but we need to keep the shamans nearby because they know where the magic crabs are. They know exactly where to get the crab and drop it in. It's going to be the same with the ayahuasca. Yes, we can get a hold of the ayahuasca. We can start making it. We can start doing the rain ceremonies. But unless we are connected to the motherfuckers who know this knowledge, we are not going to be able to have the ability to heal ourselves the way that they've been healing themselves for generations. Mm -hmm. That is my take on it. But, so I go the ayahuasca. But see, the thing is, if we go down a conspiratorial route, mm -hmm. DMT is a class A drug in this country. 100%. A class A drug, class at the highest level. It's class class systems are set up on, is this going to kill you? Maybe? Well, let's not do it then. That's it. The fear of death and but the then whole culture. You go back to that thing, cut alcohol and cigarettes. Mm. Yeah. They'll yeah. kill you before mace drugs. Literally. I think people are like, can you not die for ayahuasca? And I was like, you can die for surgery. But it doesn't mean that we ban surgery. What we did is highly train the surgeons so that they can go in and heal us. Same with all this stuff. We go to get shamans and we go to get them trained up so that they can come and they can heal us because we're off, aren't we? We need to heal us. That's the thing, but see, because we're in the West and a massive thing with the West is it's all fully propaganda, with fully news, with fully these prescription medications, like one a day or that shit. But like, they there, it's spirituality, it's religion, it's like, see when you, like as you say, see when you're telling people the story like, about uh, when you've turned your back in Islam, mm, totally. and that's the bit they get uncomfortable with. None of the rest no, of it is no, that totally. bit, because it's religion. Mm. These people have just got this kind of thing where they this inbuilt atheism, mm. like, no, that can't be right. Science, so, like, uh, what are you talking about, mate? It's faith. Then I, science is a, a, is faith based. You have faith in science, you can have faith in a higher power. Me personally, see with religion, mm. and this is my personal standpoint, I just believe religion's personal preference. Yeah, totally. Because different religions will teach you different principles mm. of life. So I just believe whatever you feel you're most, most connected to, that's the path you follow. Absolutely. And I, that's, that's just my belief on it. Mm. See, and the thing with Alaska is, to you look, at, look at all the ingredients in it, mm -hmm. then putting a crab in. <laughs> how, how do you think that was actually made? Like, like, made like, initially, like, 
you think one day somebody just went like that, I'm bored, and flung all these things that flung shit at once and it stuck? Or was there a connection to a higher consciousness that when they helped a- them when, that? When, asked, when asking the shamans how it was made, they said uh, the jungle told us. So they get that connection to nature and they said that it told them how to make it mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. and we just don't have that do you know what I mean if somebody was in there but we love that like you know um, Eureka the guy got in the bath and the water spilled there and he was like oh I've got it we love it when it's all today with science and mathematics we can handle that but when it comes to nature and healing we just don't have the concept for that do you think we're just so far uh, disconnected fit now as a society like maybe back because mm. look at the ancient Egyptians I'm sure they used uh, uh, ayahuasca as well mm. you did uh, that ancient Amazonians like we look at religion and where it mm. began like in that part in history, mm. and you look at where we're at now, like the kind of industrial era, mm. if we want to call it that, it's like, there's, you wonder too, sometimes I, I think to myself, like, is it a big thing today where, where the powers that be try and kind of shun this kind of thinking out? Because if you believe in spirituality, mm. you believe in a higher purpose, you're not going to go and work in a factory if mm. that isn't for you, mm. but if you think you need to buy into this I need to pay a mortgage, I need to get two holidays a year, I need mm. to go to the materialistic stuff, I need to be a consumer, mm. then I'm happy to do whatever job will pay me that money. Yeah, well, Reagan in the 60s, man, Ronald Reagan, when the Ramdas and Timothy O'Leary, who, if anybody is interested in doing kind of psychedelic work, there's always been, since the 60s, there's been people going, this stuff will make you crazy, don't do it, you'll kill yourself. These people have always existed. Timothy O'Leary and Ramdas, they wrote a lot of like books on safety, setting, setting, so if you are interested in experiences, I would say go read up on it. Go read up on the people who've like who've created this path for us to go down. But Reagan made sure to like put Tim O'Leary in jail. He planted joints in his car so they could get him arrested and they tortured him in prison and all this because he was getting LSD out to people and his whole thing was like I can't even remember them but it was like tune out Drop out, uh, like it was like it was like it was like drop ge- LSD, not bombs, because it was I, during the Vietnam War. All that? that stuff, that like, was a big thing. Fuck as well. school, fuck getting a job in a factory. It was like open your mind to this stuff. And the Republican government was like, nah, nah, this is no good for us, man. Get these hippies, get them. So mm. I don't think that's ever changed. I think it's always been there. But yeah, man, I do think it's um, it's partly in British values as well as like. Because they're like, the tribes are running about naked, man. So we're all looking at them going like, oh, if this man had any decency, he would cover up his genitals. So <laughs> we think he's a dafty because he's got his balls out. Well, like, he doesn't know nothing. But he's been connected to thousands of years of ancient knowledge and we mock him because he's got a willy blown in the wind. Ridiculous, man. Nice. We need to think it's different cultures, it's different places in the world, but we need to respect the knowledge. And, you know, it's the same way everywhere. That's I think. exactly that because we look, we look at our culture and we think, a lot of people would think we're more advanced in that. We've got cities, we've mm. got skyscrapers and that. But when you look at these cultures, they don't eat processed food. They don't use fucking fluoride in their toothpaste. Mm. They've got healthy teeth. Mm. They've got healthy bodies. I think when you compare the rate of like cancer and diseases, mm. it's like a, a fraction of yeah. what it is in like Western society. No. And that's a big thing. So when you look at it, see when you talk about when you went into Aldi mm. after it and you've seen the queues, <laughs> you've seen it, and you're like, ah, this is madness. That'll be the way they probably view us. And yeah, yeah. Like, who's the on? ones that are right? <laughs> Not on top of it. It's like when you actually look at it and for that perspective. When did you do ayahuasca? Uh, three weeks ago. Three weeks three ago, weeks so it was ago. really recent. This is why, I, as I was telling people the story, I could feel myself going back to the place, but the mere stories I was telling, the mere I was losing it. Right. So that's why I wanted to get this in with you quick, because I feel like that's going to be the last big delivery of the story that I'm going to be able to do. I'll be able to tell it, but not with the same connection that I've had. Uh-huh. So hopefully whatever we captured here, people get a wee sense of it and it goes out. And there's going to be a lot of fear. As I tell people this, there's a lot of fear, but there's also fear and curiosity. And I think it's you're able to hold both things at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it can mm-hmm. sound very scary. And parts of it were very scary, but I was also always safe. And I had the connection both to the medicine and to the shaman and to the higher purpose, power, force, whatever you want to call it. It's all in there, and it takes you through it. You, you're not just in there. As people have been saying, they're like, uh, I told my family the whole story like two days after, and my mom was explaining it some day at work, and it was like, you drink this mad stuff, and it makes you see things. And I was like, oh, come on! Aye. I was like, I've done Sold a five-minute dance for you so you can <laughs> say that it got a bit trippy, come on! <laughs> but we just don't have the vocabulary or the, the other way to look at it. So Aye, it's, as well as that, it's like, for me, if I was to tell that experience, because even you, you were telling the story, I couldn't, I couldn't even do... At justice in any mm. way, shape, or form, to the way you could, because you're a great storyteller. Thank you, man. But I could imagine me telling that story mm. as well, because it's a personalised experience. Mm-hmm. Because the way you're telling it compared to how you experienced it, mm-hmm. 
is probably no doing it justice. I, I, no, and I was trying to write it down straight away. So, like, with the star that I was arguing with later on in the night, so much time had passed that the star had moved to the next window. And I was looking at it, and I was, I was like, no, you again, man. I was like, I thought we'd left this behind. And he was like, I'm you. And I was like, how am I you? And he was like, because everything is just one thing. Separation is an illusion created by people and nations. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. And when he said that to me, I felt ultimate oneness with everybody. I felt connected to all the people in that room, all the people in my life, all the people that had died that I've known, all the people that I've yet to meet. I could feel that connection of oneness, but it's gone. It's gone. Now and again, I get wee tiny glimpses of it, but if you could, if you were to speak to me while I was in that oneness, I wouldn't be able to tell the story. You'd be like, tell me about it, and I'd just be like, ah, wow. Mm. Mm. So you need to come out of it to be able to go, oh, by the way. To reflect. Yeah, and be able to like share the information through stories and that. But it's like um, the only way that you're really going to know is by going to that space. Ah, you need to do it. You need to do it. It's like DMT as well. See, whenever uh, people would offer me, because it was there was a period where it was kicking about and mm. my pals were all taking it. And times I'd sit there and I'd, and I'd be about to try it and mm. I'd shout out it and they'd be like, ah, I'm like, what, what do you see? Mm. Like, ah, it's, it's so hard. And they try and explain it and mm. you're just... The more they try and explain it, the more like, mm. confused I'd be like, oh, what? It just, it then I done sense. it, then it was like, it was just a fucking experience, man. Yeah. But see, when you spoke about, when you were speaking to the star, and the star mm. was saying, I am you, or you're a star, mm. it was a line, a line, making kind of lines. I could kind of resonate with that. I was in work one night, and usually I like to read a book. Sometimes, mm. see if I, I'm like, I just kind of want a break, mm. fail at editing yeah, or yeah. whatever I'm doing. And I didn't have a book, but I work my student accommodation, so there's like a wee bookshelf there for the students just to help themselves. Fair, fair. And it's usually books like accounting and mm. novels and that. I'm not really a novel guy, and mm. I'm like, right, I'm going to go to this bookshelf. And I was at the bookshelf, and I'm like, I'm going to find a book. You believed. That there's going to be a book. Mm. And I was looking through it, and one book, it jumped out. It was like an orange cover. It pure stood out. Mm. And i just seen it. It was Conversations with God, it was called. <laughs> it was about a guy, right? And he'd basically had this experience where he spoke to God. Mm. And he asked God all these questions. And he, and he wrote it down. And he turned it into a book. Wow. Neil something McDonald. Uh, Neil, mm. I forgot the guy's name. And uh, I ended up reading the book. And it was basically all these questions he was asking. Whether he was speaking to God or whether he was connecting with a higher consciousness mm. in himself. Mm. Regardless if, I've never spoke to God personally, mm. but I'd imagine if I had a conversation with God, this is how he would answer the questions. Mm. And he spoke about that, like humans, like we're all one, mm -hmm. always one, and it's that thing God made man in his image. It's like that, we are all it's part constant. of God. And I believe it. When you look at it, if you go, like if there's a God, there must be a devil, mm -hmm. good and evil. And I always think it's like, we don't look at right as this guy with big fucking horns mm. uh, doing below mm. earth that's causing everybody to murder each other mm. or is this big hairy ass fucking <laughs> bearded guy in the clouds that's making all the good happen. I think it's in mankind. Mm. So when you see like somebody acting good, you've got that, it's like the angel and the devil on your shoulder. Mm. I believe mm. that is God. I think it's all within us all. Totally. And plus as well, when people go, when you look at these atrocities that happen in the world, people go, well, how can there be a God if mm. this is all happening? But, you always question the existence of God when bad stuff happens, mm. but see when you see somebody doing a lot of work for charity mm. or helping uh, children that mm. are in need and all that kind of stuff, you never go, oh, right, that's because of God. Mm. You thank the individual, but you blame God mm -hmm. when it's evil. Mm -hmm. I think it all comes from within. I think it's all within us, and that thing, we're always one. Mm -hmm. We're all interconnected. You realise that, and as you say, it's an illusion. It's society mm. that disconnects us when you go, look, it's football, politics, race, Definitely. sexuality, all these things. These are all kind of like, Man made, mm. so it's a society it's not, that I, made this outside my house. There's um, there was a uh, electricity box, uh -huh. and and a lot of electricity books he's running about cast milk now. Uh -huh. As um, somebody's just wrote fuck Islam, and that's for the war started. And uh, oh, fuck, it's terrible for getting the uh, Palestine. Aye, let me do that again, and we'll, we'll edit around that. Bit. <laughs> uh, it says fuck Islam, and that's for the war started in Palestine. So I, when I first seen it, I was raging because it was inside my house and I was like, fuck Islam. I was like, that's me, that's my people. How dared you? Division, you know, separation. Aye. And I went out and I just kind of changed it into some shapes. Man, done a wee bit of art on it. I like and it. I was like, yeah, I changed it around. And a few days later, they'd came back and they'd wrote in bigger letters, fuck Prophet Muhammad. And I, I'm <laughs> sure he wrote Muhammad right as well. So I was like, ah, there's some education going down. And I was so pissed off at the YTC or the YCT. I don't know because they've got all the letters together. And right. I, I've never heard of your scheme. But um, I was so pissed off. And then after a while, I was like, oh, 
it's not their fault as like they've internalised Islamophobia. They did with the media and the information exactly what I did with my own race and my own culture. I was told to hate it and so I absorbed it and I did hate it. Mm -hmm. And um, But I'm going to go around and I'm going to sort out their boxes, man. I'm going to... Go ahead, I can't. There's maybe grass in my cell, in, but I've got plans for all these boxes that say "fuck Islam." But I like it. I like it how you turned it into that. Yeah, I think I think that's the way to fight it, right? Because I was going to write, "Who's your top man?" Tell them to meet me at McDonald's. Fuck at your CYT. Fuck your CYT. Fuck your milk. All this, man. And then after a while, I was like, "No, that's division. That's and that's just me dealing with my own stuff. That's because part of my life, I would have wrote fuck Islam Aye. on top of a big fuck bowl. Castle Milk, Mona Soya Milk. Absolutely, <laughs> man, Absolutely. So I'm, we were just saying about conversation with God. God, man, I did actually have a, a conversation with God, but I've no got it in there now. But if you would like to hear it on the thirty first of March on Black Friars, there's going to be me gracing the stage at Space Cadet, an hour of collected psychedelic tales and plant medicine adventures that took me for a young boy I was deep in the scheme with no sense of who I was to the man you've saw on Five O's podcast today. Tickets available. Check out socials. Oh, Terry and Boyd, all going to Space Cadet. Google. Space Cadet Terry and Boyd and you will find your tickets there tickets still available but not too many we'll see you there on the 31st of March get in a fucking business baby usually I wouldn't allow cross promotion but my event is sold out so you can <laughs> get a, a ticket for my event so if you're looking for something today on Easter Sunday get yourself to Tarium's event both events somebody's going to be knocked out there we go exactly there's going to be a mass knockout at Tarium's <laughs> event when you turn up and witness the spe spectacular tales from the man himself Get so see when you talk about integration mm. what else went on during the integration because you say so, these bullet points one was to come on the podcast what the, else went down the first thing it told me today was to um, contact a guy who I know through um, Roots he does like funding and stuff right. and um, so I think that was an early one because I thought he was going to get me into the, the art therapy but that just appeared but what I'm realising now is that what I want to do is make sure that we've got some connection to... Because like if you, we start, you start something that's not quite right. Started a drama class in Cast Milk, but wasn't feeling the connection to it. Uh -huh. My pal's new on it. It's very good. So on a Monday in Cast Milk, if you go when you want to go. But I want to have these art classes that on the just art classes as in come in and we'll teach you how to be a good draw. Mm -hmm. Fuck being a good draw. I need to put that up front and centre because that stops so many people ever picking it up. I'm no good at drawing. I don't care. You can take your bum, sit it in some paint, and then sit your bum on a bit of blank paper, and that counts as art. You don't need to be good at drawing. You just need to have the creative ability. But I want to go around and make sure that we can get to, especially neurodivergent young people, and give them this art. But the main thing isn't going to be the painting. It's going to be healing. There's healing to be done in this. And I want to make sure that we can scale that up and take it all about. So that was the first person that I asked I told me to talk to. But first I need to go do my training and get all the stuff like safeguarding down. I need to get the ability to be able to like handle if something comes up, if kids are walking through something and then they feel a lot of emotions coming up. I've took a counselling skills course, but I think I need to do one that's more tailored to young people. Uh -huh. Sorry, this is all me just talking about my stuff. So that was number one. Number two, it said go to mosque and get connected with the mosque. But uh -huh. I phoned my dad. And I had and I was like, Dad, I need to go to mosque. And he was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He was like, hold on. He was like, find your own connection to the faith. It was like, Islam is just a way to get to the big light. He's like, find your own path, then go to mosque. So the things the ayahuasca told me on the TRT, they were kind of like starting points. And then I went and done it. Um, the other one was tell people about this experience, which was you, which was a direct one. I was like, go and do that. And then what was the third one? Oh, the third one was... Um, Go start training at uh, Ravy Davies. That was the, because it was said, it let me know that, like, because the art is the main thing now, I was looking at all these other things as career paths. I was like, you don't need to do that now. It was like, go have fun. Um, the thing that they kept saying during the, the ayahuasca was like, only joy, only joy. So hard work and all that's great, but you need to go do what brings you joy. So uh -huh. I've like ticked off all day once and fair done day four. The rest have started to like, it starts to open up. The paths are revealing themselves more and more uh -huh. and more. And it feels um, really fluid. Is the best thing I can say about it. It feels like effortless. Whereas before I was in my house with a bit of paper going, what am I going to do? I'm going to be a stand-up. I'm going to do a tour of the UK. And it was so hard today. And I was so desperate to get progress and fame. Mm -hmm. I was desperate for fame, man. Wanted everybody in the world to be like, ah, you're famous, aren't you? Maybe like, ah, um. uh, as I went through and done the ayahuasca, I was able to let go of all that stuff. And it wasn't like a, after it, I had to go, oh, do it, do it, do it, and add it all up. It just left. All the bullshit just went. It was like physical. It was like, I don't know, a tooth falling out. It just disappeared. And then yeah. suddenly there was space to be able to put in this new stuff. 
So it's pretty much when I'm at now and everything feels amazing. I feel more set than I've ever felt in my life. This sense that I know what I want today has never <clears throat> been there before. I've never had that before. I've wanted it desperately, craved it, couldn't get it. Ayahuasca gave me that and it also gave me a profound sense of healing, which I was able to witness and other people as well. All the people that went to that ceremony came out different. They came out changed and they came out clearer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, see, that's what I was going to ask you because remember, see when you say you were on your way to your first ceremony, you were driving, mm. you felt you were driving to your death. Mm. Do you think that was the death of the old you? I think it was a definitely an ego death took place and um, it was the death of the barriers the, the defence mechanisms that I'd built around myself uh -huh. about um, my sexuality, about my Islamic roots, about who I was as a person. All these defences had been built up and that's why I was so tight. I was mm -hmm. like this. I'm having a laugh. Are you having a laugh? Da -da, I love life, man. I'm having a good time. And that was me. I couldn't tell the difference. And then going to the ayahuasca, I was able to go, Ugh! and Aye. broke the barriers right down and was like, you can just be, you can just exist. You're a part of nature. Whatever's in you is totally natural. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's come out for it recently is I was having a lot of trouble with intrusive thoughts. Uh -huh. Just bad thoughts that were coming up for a long time before the ayahuasca. Yeah. Pretty much like, you can't do that. You never want to go into detail, but uh, like, like... Holding a child and your brain's like, ah, throw that way in a way. Like that, but I, I didn't even... this guy or something like that. I, I get them all the time. There. I get them all the time. I'd be sitting in my house and it would just be like, here's the worst things that you can think of. And I thought that was me. Uh -huh. I was like, well, I'm a terrible person then because who would even think of something that's yeah. messed up? Yeah. But um, going and working with a, bit of a CBT therapist, he told me that, no, no, thoughts are just thoughts. You've got your senses, which is everything you feel. You've got your thoughts, which is the mind. You've got the intellect, which is like the one above that like knows. And then you've got the buddhi, which is like the undescribable godhead in the sky that we are all connected the what? to. The buddhi. The buddhi. buddhi. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. The buddhi or the, buddhi? The buddhi, the buddhi, the big the, buddhi. Uh, it's big always buddhi. the buddhi I up there. I give me like the buddhi. The buddhi, I don't have it. So but is it your CBT therapist told you this? Uh, he told me about the senses and the mind and then for the Bhagavad Gita I was reading the same day. What's that? Um, it is like the Hindu Bible and if you really want to understand God in a way that's understandable, read the Bhagavad Gita. It's not even that long, it's like 12 chapters and it's um, it's basically, it's a guy, it's like, it's, it's I think in the original Hindu it's all one big song, which I think is cool, so a right. song starts to finish. But in the book when you read it, it's got a wee bit at the start of the chapter that tells you what's going on, uh -huh. and then it's got the, the main characters is Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna is just a guy, he's chilling, and then Krishna is God. And the whole book is basically just Arjuna being like, uh, how are you God? What do you mean? How does this work? Why is there bad things in the world? Why does this happen to me? The whole book's just that, and it's just Krishna being like, uh, this, that, that, answering his questions. And um. The best way to understand God that I think is that everything is a metaphor. And in primary and secondary school, I never understood what metaphors were. I understood the simile was like, you know, um, it feels like or it is like. But I never got what a metaphor was. But metaphors are everything. For example, if somebody says I got a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach, you don't actually have a pit in your stomach uh -huh, that lives uh -huh. below it. Uh -huh. No, no, just a, a way to describe uh -huh. it. If somebody goes on a date and they said we clicked, mm -hmm. doesn't mean they sat like that. It's, it's raining cats and dogs outside. Is it? No actual cats and dogs. Uh -huh. If you go on a date and say they had tons of red flags, he's not like that. It's all metaphors. Uh -huh. So God itself is a big fucking metaphor and you've got to find whatever metaphor suits you the best because exactly. it, it's unattainable. You're never going to hold in your head what God is and all these psychedelic and plant medicine experiences that I've had, when you do get a wee sense of it, it's overwhelming and that's about that's a slither a slithery is too much for your brain to handle so you're never going to know what God does uh -huh. don't think it's a man in the sky that's a metaphor if you like that metaphor you can use Aye. it if you don't don't worry about it but the Bhagavad Gita is just a beautiful explanation of how to interact with God is it a religious text or is it a lot of knowledge? religious text totally religious, religious text, text. Yeah, I need to get the name of that because it sounds quite interesting yeah, the, just the Gita uh, G-I-T-A like, oh, check G -I -T -A. out the Gita I like it that's much more simple yeah than, I was, I, 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 this is a new thing I've started doing I take notes now yeah I'm professional man. ah yeah. professional it's and you're going to get wisdom it. for the, the guests so I imagine if I was a cross for people I'd want to be like well see the thing is as well what I would always find see when somebody would tell me a story I, mm. don't get me wrong sometimes I do interject but mm. sometimes I let them tell the story but they'll say something a story mm. and like that I'll need to right, ask yeah. about that but no matter how long a story goes you might get a few points like that mm. and it's hard to keep them on your head mm. no it's not the way forward so I think I don't know it might have been the last time we'd done the podcast mm. you spoke about how you'd went into recovery I think mm. it was the first time you'd done it in fact mm. and you'd went into recovery and uh, the reason why you went into this because uh, you believed you had uh, sex addiction mm. but now as you've became more open, you became open, your sexuality, you're in a new relationship, mm. do you think that was possibly a symptom of not being able to come to terms with your sexuality? I would say almost definitely, um, because 
Well, first, when I went into recovery, I think one of the things was lockdown, was being in lockdown for so long. And I was in a relationship during lockdown as well. Mm -hmm. Very difficult relationship, a very difficult breakup to go through. Mm -hmm. And then my first adult breakup as well, my first adult heartbreak, which I'd never experienced, had been neurodivergent and having hypersensitivity. I felt every second of that breakup. It was so, so painful. And um, recovery was like a lifeline. I was able to go and and in meetings and be able to find other people who had suffered in similar ways, worse ways, better ways. I think there is some sort of peace in being like, my life's so bad. And then you hear somebody say something and you're like, oh, all right, well, we've got the same thing going on because we've got that same feeling, even though the circumstances are totally different. Uh -huh. And I would never end up your circumstances and you'd never end up mine, but we've got the same thing bonding us. So I went into it, but I did definitely find that I think 12 step. The first thing to say is that recovery saves lives. Without a doubt, recovery saves so many lives and it's really important. But I do think there is a healing and a hurting element to recovery in a 12-step. But obviously there's the hurt that you need to go through. And then I think there's also, when I was in, when I first went in, it was beautiful, but there was an element of um, performativeness in it. I was like, I'm here to get sober and I'm going to get a sponsor and I'm going to do really good. And yes, I'm doing my steps and things are going really well. But really, I never had a deep connection to recovery. I never fully gave myself it yet. And I think part of it was because I knew it wasn't in my path. Uh -huh. I knew it wasn't the way that I was supposed to go. I knew I wanted healing and I wanted to feel better. And I wanted to basically feel the way that I feel the new. Mm -hmm. I wanted that through recovery. But recovery didn't get me there. And to everybody who saw me, like, quote-unquote, leave recovery, I was a failure to them. I'd failed because if you were really serious about recovery, you would be here, doing the steps and working it. There's no other way to do it. This is the only way to do it. And I think that can be really damaging rhetoric because recovery is a path. Uh -huh. But it's no everybody's path. Uh, was that, do you feel, was, was that no your own perception of what people might think of you? Or was this echoed? Um, it felt like I went into a couple of different versions of uh, 12 steps and some it was really pronounced and others it wasn't. It. Mm -hmm. So I think it was maybe certain groups that I was going into and you meet people and because they're in recovery and you'll know, you're like, they know what they're talking about. They, I need to do what they say. Uh -huh. They know. And there was no, I didn't, I didn't have any self authority. I didn't have any thought. I was getting it totally out of uh -huh. anybody. Uh -huh. Can anybody please guide me? Somebody uh -huh. show me what to do. And um, I definitely feel that going through the 12 steps, although it did create, it created like a wee crack in the, the pain that I was in, mm. there was other parts of it that I feel were heightened by that experience in recovery. And I feel quite guilty even saying that and mentioning it because when I was in some of the meetings, they saved, they saved me. They saved me so much. They gave me healing, mm -hmm. gave me kindness, they gave me love. But then there was other times that I felt that being ruined recovery was making me feel like there was only one way to do this. And uh -huh. because that one way wasn't working for me, it felt like I was wrong uh -huh. and I was on a bad path. Uh -huh. But a lot of that, like you say, probably does come from internal. But then it would be echoed when somebody was like, if I, you're not here, you're fucking it. <laughs> that's the thing. It's, 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 it's human nature. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not in the teachings, but when humanity gets their grips on a lot of things, they put their own principles mm -hmm. on it. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of original principles mm -hmm. and a lot of great people that stand by them. But a lot of people put their, their logic into things. Totally. Like, this is the way you date and you should date. And totally. if you don't date this way, you're fucked. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you hear, hear people get into recovery, like they're, they can be everyday drug users, drinkers, and they'll come in, they'll get clean, and then they'll leave and they'll stay clean. Mm -hmm. But there's people who'll come in and get clean, they'll leave and they'll drink themselves to a death. Yeah. It's like, as you say, the path isn't for everybody, mm -hmm. but it's a good path to go down to explore it, to 100%. go, right, mm -hmm. the I feel as if I fit in here. Mm -hmm. And at the start, and that's a big thing with addicts, is feeling like you don't fit in. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing, that's like, for a young age, you'll find a lot of people saying that, they, never, they felt like they never fit in, mm -hmm. and whether drugs, alcohol, might have been sex that mm. helped him fit in, mm. and uh, and and that was my my experience with like drugs and alcohol. A lot of that was just to fit in, mm. to be all oh, right. I, I know that experience as well, and uh, but as I say, it's not for everybody. No, but I I don't like that fitting in. I think what you're talking about. I think you've nailed it there. I d I didn't feel like I fit in any when I was when I was an SA when I was an A when I was an any. I felt like a poser. I didn't feel like I was supposed to be there and I tried my hardest to be an addict. I really did. I tried to walk like an addict and talk like an addict and I always remember going to an AA meeting and then telling some random guy, I was like, I'm just at my first AA meeting. And I remember being like, 
I'm not really doing the anonymous part of that very well right. at all. And I think it was it was exactly what you say is that I could did not have any. I was so funny because the family that raised me were like, accept yourself, love yourself. And that was the biggest thing. It was like, be who you are, fuck everybody else. That was the real strong principle. But I just didn't have a way to interact with my sexuality. I didn't have a way to make sense of it. I didn't have a way to not feel like being gay is bad. Just down to the basis. I didn't have a way around that. Because mm-hmm. I was told it so much and I, and I raised by it. Gay is bad. If you're gay, you're no good. Uh-huh. So then when I was having feelings about homosexuality or about pansexuality. I was like, oh, so I'm a bad person here. Well, well, I'll tell it's good if you're straight. So what I'll do is I'll make sure that I can be loved by people for being somebody who is straight. My character and the parts of me that I emphasised were straightness. I love buds and I love diddies and I love shagging. Do you love shagging? Oh, me too. Can I get enough of a shagging? And all the gay stuff, just fucking get it down there and repress it. Don't let it out. Don't let it out. And then it would come up in all these terrible ways, man. I'd feel awful about myself. Self-hatred, self-disgust, binge eating, binge drinking, drug taking, just trying to numb all these feelings down. And so it wasn't so much it was the addiction that was the problem. The drugs and alcohol was the solution. The problem was a lack of a lack of, I had no knowledge of how to accept myself. Uh-huh. Even though my family had said, accept yourself, accept yourself, nobody had ever gave me the roadmap and the way there. And I think that's where the 12 steps can be, as delving into all the shit so that you can look at it, process it, and then accept yourself. And then once you've accepted yourself, you can connect back into the world and the big light and everything can become peaceful. And I think plant medicine and psychedelics gave me that, Gave me what I was looking for. It got me to that point of feeling recovered. Like I'd go back in touch mm-hmm. with my younger self. Like I could be one whole authentic person mm-hmm. without having to go down this very specific route. But um, I definitely... Oh, fuck. I lost what I was going to say there. You're talking about how the 12 steps can uh, lead people into accepting themselves, but you find you accept, oh, I, accept yeah, yourself yeah. with the plant medicine. Well done, yeah. But um, but in some of my experiences with psychedelics, there was a huge cost a massive cost to what I was doing. I remember I took mushrooms at a party once and I was in the room thinking that I had made a film called The Cupboard that won an Oscar. And that's, you're probably looking at the closet, coming out the closet, being very happy, yeah, probably right. something in that. But I was in this room for ages, greeting, going, we've done it, we've done it, we've made it. People are, were on cocaine and such at the party, walking by the door, going, is the wee man all right in there? And I'm at my nut, going, we've made it, oh, we've made it. That lasted with me for about six months. I ended up, I remember in there, I was like, I'm going to make a film called The Cupboard and I'm going to, I'm going to be in it and I'm going to get a woman to direct it. And I went and I, I set a meeting with a director pal of mine and I remember she was talking to me and I was like, well, I'm going to make a film and it's going to be called The Cupboard. And she was like, when, when are you doing this? And I was like, no, it's just an idea. It's an idea. And she was like, I don't think I can do this. And I realised there and then, I was like, oh, I'm still tripping. I was like, I'm still tripping. This whole idea that I've got was just like, literally, a drug-induced hallucination. It might have had context deep down, but for about six weeks, I was living in that, being like, I'm going to make a film, I'm going to make a film. So in these settings, like these ceremonial settings, where there's a system to it and there's a structure to it, you can get all the stuff in there. But when you're just out taking mushrooms and taking acid, it spills air into your life. So I think that... I had to learn through my own mistakes, but I would never recommend that for anybody. I would recommend if you do want to get the healing benefits, and that's the main reason that we're doing this, for everybody out there that's watching and going, oh, drugs, drugs, drugs are bad. So is Islam, so is being gay. We get told all these things are bad, but what we're really looking for is the healing and the connection, mm-hmm. and we'll try to find that. Drugs, quote unquote, can provide that, but <clears> only if you do it the right way. Aye, mm. aye so under the right circumstances, and like, if you look at like, ayahuasca, like, there's certain drugs, cocaine, alcohol, mm. they're not, you're not going to get any healing via mm. them. Apparently, marijuana, that mm. is a plant medicine, but it's like, it's just, it's so overused yeah. and abused. And plus as well, I could make ayahuasca in my loft. Mm. You could probably get a trip. Mm. Doesn't mean it's going to heal you. No. You need to go to the source. You need, mm. as you, need, you need to find the shamans. Mm. You need to know the people that have got the lineage mm. through which this medicine was made, it was mm. developed, it was, it was learned to be controlled because mm. when you're delving into that part of life and they, they don't go to school and teach you about spirituality no. and the inner child and all that stuff this is a fucking you're going into it's like going into the desert without a mat mm. well, I mean you're going out into the middle of nowhere you might end up in a fucking bit of quicksand mm. and drowning 
I think this is why things like your podcast are really important because I think like a lot of a lot of, a lot of all that stuff that you just described was just for weirdos. It's for weirdos, man. If you done any of this stuff, you were a weirdo. Mm -hmm. But when you can get people on your podcast, intelligent people, educated people that can just explain to us in such simple terms, like here's what it is, here's what you've been told it is, and here's what it is. And mm -hmm. I think that's like an invaluable service to people mm -hmm. because also, don't get me wrong, I love the jail stories, man. See, when I say it, it's people like ask what I was like, oh, I wish I was in the jail so I could hear. <laughs> I think that's... It's entertainment as well, but I think the, the stories and the experiences that these people are sharing is essential because it's honest and it's real. And that's being told, being having people explain these things to us in these ways going, here's what I went through, here's what it was like. That is more useful than, I don't know, getting like psychedelics class in high school because I would never listened. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'd, uh -huh. I'd have still been drawn willies in my jaw. I, I, I would I never have paid attention. I, I know. And that's the thing as well. See, when we talk about, see, like if we use the podcast for an example, what I realised quite recently, the biggest thing why a lot of people connect with my podcast, it's the relatability. Mm. It's the people that relate to, but see, the amount of stories I've, I could go into YouTube and get hundreds, Jake Paul, my ayahuasca <laughs> story, Aubrey Marcus, mm. they go out to the, the jungle, these mm. people get money, mm. they can fly out to jungles, pay all oh, these shamans mm. all this money and have an experience. I've never seen a story where a guy goes to an office block in Boston <laughs> and does ayahuasca, you know what I mean? So you're the first to tick that box and see that, that's, that's what I've actually wrote. See, this is my list of clips. And mm. uh, first one, Ayahuasca and Postal. Yeah. That is a clip. Absolutely. That is a clip. I'm, I'm actually dissecting the clip in my head. I oh, so. appreciate that, man. And that's what I want. The whole reason that I wanted to do this was that, like, there's going to be, if it goes the way I think that it's going to go, and you know, never make assumptions, but I do think that this plant medicine healing is going to become a lot more pronounced in the next, like, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that we need to do is talk about it. Aye. That's the first step. That's all we need to do. Talk about it, tell people, share this clip about it, show it to people, tell people about the experience you heard, ask people about it, and look up other people's experiences and just get talking about it. And then it'll slowly start to come. And then you'll have, of course, dodgy shamans in the barras that are like, do you want to do ayahuasca for a ten or do it like an empty ginger bottle or whatever? <laughs> we'll deal with that when we get Who, there. Who's that math ayahuasca? <laughs> I mean, Put some Snapchat, get literally. banging ayahuasca yeah. there. Out till ten, good ayah there. Three we'll, for a ton. We'll deal with all that Three when we get there. Three cups for a ton. I wouldn't say bribe, you get cunts sitting in that. That's the thing as well, see, because I've been half it now. I think I've uh, came that far away from drinking and mm. getting mad with it. See, when I look at cunts sitting on Instagram stories with balloons hanging mm. out their mouth and I'm like, is that what it's morphed into? <laughs> I was like, no, I mean, it was like, I, I felt myself, I, I looked at myself as if I was a bit more upper class because I had a note hanging out my nose. <laughs> it was a fucking a balloon hanging out your mouth. Like, come on, to, I got out the right, at the right time. You felt you found your peak. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I think I never loved gaff culture. I never loved it, but it was all there was. It was the only place I could go and do these these weird experiments that I wanted to do. Uh -huh. It just so happened at the same time, every day was like, you're staying up, you're staying up, you're staying up. I didn't want it. I, I look at it as well, man. See, when I think about like, sitting in a house for like three days mm. straight, and back then to me, that was the norm, that mm. was my life, and now I look at it, I'm like, that's three days to me, I try and get as much productivity <laughs> done in a day as possible, so three days to me is quite valuable. Yeah. So when I look at three days sitting, talking shit, mm. It's like, I'm like ah, it's just to me it's, it's mind boggling mm. to think of it but now when I look at it as well I think there's a big world out there like I was in London for two mm. days there and just wandering about and I'm like ah, I used to just sit in hussies dicking for <laughs> days and like every every fucking I get these wee mm. epiphanies every so often like ah, wow. no, I'm going about I'm experiencing mm. life but do you not think that when you were in the gaffes and you were in these situations what you were looking for was actually healing you were uh, going in feeling rough that's exactly it and then you were like I want to feel better yeah, let's man. all get together get out on that and then we'll feel better but that's just no true. Nah. You end up feeling worse. That's it. But I feel as if, see when you talk about when you need to experiment with life, mm. that is an experiment of life in itself because when you look at some people and they avoid all that stuff, don't get me wrong, if, if, it, if it's no your cup of tea, it's no your cup of mm. tea. But <laughs> for me, I've tried it. Now I know what it's like. So mm. I'll never feel the need or the want to go back to it because yeah. I know what I'm going back to. It's no like, oh, well, I never drank. I missed mm. out in a lot. Oh, fuck it. I'm going to go out the night. Mm -hmm. It's like, I've been there. I've yeah. seen it. So let's see what the rest of mm -hmm. life has got to offer. And I think one thing I do want to ask you about is um, guilt in general right. when it comes to substances and stuff. So as somebody who's planning on going and working with young people, obviously, of course, if young people are watching this, the parents have failed. Turn this off. This isn't for the, <laughs> way. This isn't for the wains. Get this, get this. But as somebody who wants to go and work with young people, I am very conscious of talking about my experiences because I don't want to influence young people to be going down that route. But uh -huh. my real feeling is, is that 
they're already going to go down that route because that's what we get gave in the scheme. We get gave intoxication as healing. Mm-hmm. We're taught that for our moss molten fags to watching people get steaming in the pub to big celebrations. We see that intoxication makes people feel good. Mm-hmm. And then we just totally follow that. But I was raised in an anti-drug family. They were uh-huh. like, don't do drugs. They were like, have a wee drink now and again, but don't ever do drugs. So when I started to smoke marijuana, and as I've been told by the people that was doing the ceremony where they're like, it's a spirit. They were like, she's a spirit. If you do it with that intent, if you go in with the same intent of being like, I'm looking for healing, I'm looking for peace, you can find it. But if you're just like, oh, I need another one, man. Oh, I need to make these feelings go. Oh, they've all went away. Oh, I need another one, man. Oh. And that's how, I, that's how I lived for years was just smoke to numb, smoke to numb. And in that whole time, I was going, I shouldn't be doing this. I should be a good boy. I should not be taking drugs. I should be sober and all this. And I think that was another reason I was so desperate to be in recovery because I was like, this will make me sober. And when I'm sober, finally, my family will be like, ah, well done, son. So all this stuff, this guilt and this shame was a part of the process. And that's what I was running for. And the matter did it. The guilt I felt, and mm-hmm. the guilt I felt, the matter I wanted to numb, so mm-hmm. it was vicious. And your experiences uh, intoxication, was there ever an element of guilt involved in it? But whilst I was in the in the midst of like the madness, obviously the, the roughness, like, oh, oh, but uh, like in the the early days of taking it and stuff, was there ever a guilty feeling, or was it just? Yeah, well, see, to be honest, I never, I drank. I remember the first time I drank, and it was Mary. Uh, right, everybody's drinking. I think I was fourteen. I drank a two oh, liter, yeah. two liter of pulse. It was cider. Pulse, remember pulse. Paralytic. I was mm. all over the place. We're getting wide. We couldn't wake up. People were standing in my neck and all. Do it. I swear to God. And uh, but then I was like waiting in the house and all that, mm. and I was like never again. And mm. I never drank for like a year. Oh, wow. But I used to hang about, and I never really used to drink. I'd hang mm. about with people, and they'd all be drinking. Mm. Like you know, drinking for you're a weirdo, mm. all that shit. Mm. So I was always like. They were all getting mad be fighting each other, mad be sober, and I'm like, ah, I said to me. Then uh, eventually, I just started drinking to fit in. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember the first time I actually started, it was, uh, I planned it during that week, I'm going to have a drink this weekend, mm-hmm. and the day I picked, it was like a Sunday, it wasn't even if it, as if it was a pure nice day, it was pushing rain, cloudy, and we went down, it was a couple days, and we sat in my pal's kitchen, and see, it was one of the kitchens where you open the door and you open it into the back garden. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of how wet it was. We sat with the door open in the kitchen, we were looking onto this garden, just drinking bucky. And I remember drinking it and then that way I was able to come out my shell a bit mm-hmm. there and they have a laugh in that. People were like, you're some buzz and all that. And I noticed I got accepted. Mm-hmm. It was acceptance. Acceptance. And then as time went on, I was like, ah, right, I can have a drink now. Mm-hmm. I can be one of, I can be one of the people hanging outside the shop because mm-hmm. When they were all standing outside the shop with their booze, I'm like, ah, oh, why? Monty fuck, man. Ah, I'm, I'm not getting, to... But now I was one of them. I was getting people to go in the shop <laughs> and I would get somebody to go in the shop for everybody and mm. I'd be one of the boys. Hey, and then hey, it was that acceptance thing. Five of us got to a Aye, and then, but we... <laughs> drugs, that was another weird one. It was just... it was. I think it started with experimentation, mm. which led into so, uh, external validation. Mm-hmm. So it was experimenting, like, I'm just going to try it, then trying it, then... Right, that way, it almost just feels as if that, all oh, right, we're all, we're not. Mm. I'm a part of something. We're together, there's uh-huh. the, the, the oneness. That Aye, we're that all, oneness, yeah, we're all a part of, I'm mm. fleeing, I know what it's like. I'm fleeing as well. All right, I've, 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 I've smoked, I've smoked there, hash. Mm. Mm. I know what it feels like mm. to be stoned or that. But mm. I never, don't give me an eye, I liked Eckies at the time. Mm. Never really liked hash, and mm. I never really smoked it. Mm. Then, uh, I never really started dabbling gear, I was like 20. Mm. And that was one of the ones, it was many, I fucking like, try that, try mm. that. And I can't even remember when it happened. I used to drink without taking gear, then mm. I couldn't drink without taking it. So and then it just became a thing where it was a compulsion. I tell, I've heard there's a chemical and there's a chemical in alcohol that when mixed with what's in cocaine is one of the like most potent addictive chemicals uh, in the brain. And it creates a new chemical. And that's why as soon as people have a drink, they're like, ah, we're getting a bit. We're getting a bag Aye. and it's like instinctual. Ah, there's but, no um, going back. It's for walking around the party kind of industry as well and different ones as well and different elements of like hosting and gigging and seeing it and you just see how many people's life is run by the level of intoxication. Mm. And I was definitely living like that for a long time. I would be like, I'm so rough, right? I'll have a drink of this and a smoke of that and then immediately I'll feel better. But I don't actually feel better. I just feel cloudier and right. all this stuff. And I just, and it's, uh, in psychology, they call it the rescuer complex. It's if you feel feelings of insignificance in childhood, then you want to rescue every day and save everybody. And I definitely got a bit of that in me, the rescuer. But I just want to like get into the schemes, man. And if we can just, it makes me want to greet sometimes, man, how... So many of these wins are just going to, need to go through exactly what we went through. All the pain, all the self hatred, all the addiction are just going to need to go through it. And some of them are only going to make it out, man. I got a bunch of pals that are deed for Street Valium that uh-huh. have just 
killed them and they're not here anymore because they never got told that they were neurodivergent or they never got gave healing or they never got gave counselling. It fucking breaks my heart that there's going to need to be another generation that goes through that again. But mm-hmm. I don't know, man. I just wish there was something we could do to help young people to be able to be like, everybody's going to tell you this makes you better. It doesn't uh, make you better. That's the thing, though. It's like, we are doing that, though. You don't mm. realise it. It's like actions speak louder than words and mm. sometimes you're doing it unconsciously. It's like, there can be a conscious thought mm. where you want to kind of spread awareness and help people and show them no, there's another way, but mm. people are watching you for the sidelines that you don't even realise are there. Mm. It's like, I get it all the time. People, a guy came up to me in the Govan Road last week. Mm. I'd done a podcast and I was walking a guy down to the subway and this guy shouted me mm. and he came up and he's like, ah, mate, this is going to sound random, man, but he's like, ah, I've, I've been watching your videos in the gym. Mm. I post videos, let's see, working out now. Mm. You've probably seen them. I don't date for a vanity mm. thing. I just get sponsored by gyms, so I date as yeah. a promo thing. Shout Some, out the I'm, sanctuary. Aye, shout, shout, shout out the Connor sanctuary. Connor Kelly, PT. Ah, here we go. <laughs> it's it's and, working. And, uh, aye, and so, but I date, I'm kind of, uh, usually I wouldn't film myself mm. working out, but he's like, ah, mate, I've, I've took a lot of inspiration for your gym videos, and mm. I've been working out, and I've lost a stone and a half. Oh, wow. And I'm like, ah, that was the first anybody's ever says, like, mm. they've watched my gym videos to and I was kind of like, ah, wow. Yeah. That's just one person. It's like, you don't realise who's actually watching, because no everybody will tell you, mm. unless instances like that but there's people watching that you don't realise see for me getting off drugs drugs was so normal mm. so many family members I knew mm. took drugs when I was younger I thought all oh, my family were all clean right. a lot of them are but as I got older I realised oh the, the, he yeah. likes a joint he Uncle smoked, Jimmy Stone ah, man. he stoned all the time or oh, they all, oh, they all smoke weed oh, they took a bit of gear and all I'm out mm. and mad with them oh, mm. you get gear and that and I'm like oh, wait a minute you take gear mm. and then you realise and you're like wow it's, it's so normally ingrained it's like fucking when you go into a, a, a pub these days you get offered a line of gear before you get offered a pint immediately it's, it's immediately. mental but it's, it's like for me when I got clean it was kind of I didn't really know what anybody get clean I didn't know I was like ah, is this weird should I be doing this mm. and since I've done it man it just it's opens up life and then mm. as I say it's been I've no drank or took gear and mm. fucking it'll be two years in July so it's a fair bit of time man mm. and I'm like when I look at it life now it's like I couldn't imagine life taking drugs. Yeah. And when you look at it, and then it's like it's almost when you're looking in. Like I walk by pubs. I couldn't imagine sitting in a pub. I'm like, what has this got to offer me? Fair and it's uh, and these things as well. It's like when we look at media, because this is a form of media, mm-hmm. but this is unadulterated. It's undiluted. When you watch like the news and stuff, mm-hmm. it's bite-sized chunks. It's it's been edited. And don't mm-hmm. get me wrong, this stuff gets edited too, but. These are the conversations that are missing from mainstream media, but mm. this is becoming mainstream media. Yeah. When's the last time, I don't know about you, I've, I watch YouTube more than it. YouTube's television to me. Mm. I don't watch BBC One, BBC Two, mm. none of that. I watch YouTube. So the younger generation, mm. TikTok and YouTube, that's all they watch. They don't watch BBC One, they don't watch the news, don't care. Mm. This is their mainstream media. Mm. So right now, we are, I think in Scotland especially, when you look at across the world, I YouTube is like massive for a lot of people. Massive YouTubers, massive TikTokers. In Scotland, we're still a wee bit further back in mm. that race, but we're at a very important stage of its development. Mm. So I give it a few years, and mm. as you say, you will see people mm. reaching it because they can reach out to us. They can relate to a story that you've told mm. and then contact you. Yeah, you're not so far this. Uh, distance for yeah, them that's, where they can reach out to you that's what I found when I was doing my ADHD talking about having ADHD online and uh-huh. people would get in touch with me and then they'd go through the diagnosis process and that was just through videos mm-hmm. and then I was like oh my god I, was like, I thought I had to be a doctor to make a difference I thought I had to go be a psychologist and all this but you can just your own experience and sharing it can have an impact on people uh-huh. and I'm, I'm never I don't think I'm ever going to start a podcast unless it's a wrestling podcast man because I could talk about wrestling all day but see having really? a day of editing <sighs> Couldn't do it. The but editing's a bit of a well, There's ways around the editing, mm. but the editing is a fucking job in itself. The editing, see, you realise, you think the podcast is the hard bit. Mm. Getting somebody to sit down and have a conversation, easy. Yeah. It's getting it edited. Getting the rest But of see, if, like me, I'm in a position, I've got my own set up, I can get, get, I know a lot of guests, mm. I can talk and I can edit. It puts you in a very powerful position. Yeah, that's You're it. the master of your own destiny. Mm. I can't it? wait till you get a wee staff. That'll be class, man. You've got like the five O offices. Ah, uh, that's it. it. Next, it, well, this is some boy studios. This mm. is uh, the, the very beginning of it. I had this epiphany when I was in uh, London. I was mm. just walking about as I need to open up studios. Like, yeah. I've got all the shit. I can do it. You're, you're, out, you're outgrowing your, your space, man. Ah, you're, you're starting this to is it. This is, I always, mate, see, to be honest, see, mm. ever since I've always had this, I've mm. always known this was my first uh, office. Mm. It was just started from house, and I love that. Mm. See, when you hear stories, 
stories like, hey, like, like Jeff Bezos mm. or was it uh, Bill Gates they started mm. for their garage yeah and right. it's like Two this, mates. Is, this is my this is my Amazon garage <laughs> that I'm talking about I God, st- started with a uh, spare room and govern it's a privilege to be in for the, the early days of I know it's privilege to have, really have you privilege to have you so see, if I could just ask you you talked about wrestling there mm. you've uh, recently joined Ravie's wrestling school tell me haven't, about that I have indeed man what's so, going on here so it was part of the the reason that wrestling was such a, a big thing was that the lack of direction is I was like, uh, if I'm doing something, I needed to be a lucrative career immediately. Uh-huh. And I was like, well, I can't be a wrestler. It's going to take me about five years to get any good. And it's going to take me like years to build up myself. And how am I going to make money? And I'm going to, so it was all this stress and confusion. So I just patched it for years. Because I started, I think I went in my first training about eight years ago, which is when I had the first bumped into you. Aye, like, aye. Years, Dave was saying he's been doing it for like 10 years or mm-hmm. something. I was like, that's why I met you. So I, I just, think you started. I, in that's how time. I met. We met at training, but then I was like, ah, patch this. And do you actually know something? That's quite a funny story. I don't know if I told them to this one, but. I remember day in wrestling training and being like, this is too gay. I remember I, rem- I remember the exact moment. I can't remember who it was, but we were dead training in the ring and somebody had me on a hammer lock where you put your horn behind the back like that and they'd done that and then they pressed themselves right up into me and they had my horn right up my back and I was like, this is too gay for me. I was like, I've got some shit I need to work through before I come back here and we all start rolling about together. Uh-huh. So I went, I haven't done my own growth and that. I came back and I was like, right, it's like a sport. There we go, there we go. It's like rugby, rugby's, uh-huh. rugby's gay, but it's not as perfect. But I had to do my own process before that. But then after I'd done the ayahuasca and I knew what I wanted to do with my life, I was like, oh, so everything else can just be fun. If there's something that I'm interested in and I want to pursue, it doesn't need to be lucrative and I don't need to make money for it and it doesn't need to be a big... I'm like, I can just do it because I enjoy it. And I love wrestling more than anything else. I really want some science done on neurodivergent people and professional wrestling. There is such a crossover. Mm-hmm. I don't know where it is. There's something in it that really affects people with ADHD, people with autism. We love wrestling. I don't know if it's the repetitive, like, ding, 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 one, two, three, if it's the... I don't know, but there's something in it that neurodivergent people love wrestling. And I have consumed wrestling since a child in a way that's un, unbalanced to the rest of the things in my life that I quite like. Quite like a bit of this and I like a bit of that. But I love wrestling, man. <laughs> Take it in and analysing it for years, not just watching it and being like, whoa, he got him! He got him with a big move! Did you see that? Yes! Watching it and being like, right, the crowd came up at that bit, but then he clapped too many times, so then the crowd went down, but then all oh, came back up later in the match. I love that, because to me it's all the same thing. It's the conducting of a mass group of people and controlling their energy. Mm-hmm. The same way the shaman does with the guitar, same way an artist does when he puts a painting up in a gallery, it's the same way when professional wrestlers are in a ring, are in an arena, are in a community centre, they're controlling the energy of that space. And watching, i seen David put on a wee show, and i seen the adult audience come in like that. <laughs> The wrestling, <laughs> it's my Wayne's birthday, I Wayne's like it, but <laughs> the wrestling, pff, don't know. And by the end of the show, Davey and the boys put on such an experience that they still had their arms folded in the face, but they had that sparkle in their eye, uh-huh. man. They were looking and they were like, whoa. And I was like, that's what it does. Uh-huh. You take them, you take somebody going, this is pish, to going, oh, wow. By the end of the show, they were all tuned in. Every, none of them were on their phones. None of them sitting there. They were acting like they were disinterested, but they were captivated. They were captured. Uh-huh. That's, that's what I love about wrestling, man. And I want there to be a Scottish WWE. And people think it's ICW. It could never be ICW because ICW was adult-focused for the start. It was 18+. plus. That's why they couldn't have got on the telly and such. It was for adults. Don't get me wrong. There was the, the, the weird shows that had kids in it and that. But I want there to be one company that's got stars, Scottish stars, the Scottish wins that they know when that show's on. It's going to be a hell of a show. And like I was saying to you earlier, the wrestlers aren't just guys that are like, oh, I'm a wrestler. The wrestlers are stars, man, mega stars. When the kids come up and talk to them, they look at them and they want to be like them and they look up to them and they've got posters of them on the wall and they're like, I want it. Ravy Davies, he's like the closest we've got to that. The wins look up and they're like, I want to be like Davey. As many that, we need many that and we need it in an actual company, man, mm-hmm. so that the Waynes can come and the adults can come and we can put stars in their eyes through this beautiful art form, which is so silly. It's the silliest art form in the world. Ugh, ugh. Oh, mm-hmm. how does that make people greet? How does that make people come up with jubilation? I don't uh-huh. know if that's a real word, man. But uh-huh. Yeah, so I want to get involved in the wrestling scene. I'll do my own wrestling for joy and I want to learn how to do some flips. But my real passion that I want to do is I want to put on these shows. I want to put on huge spectacle shows. It's going to take years and years. And I, one thing that I'm big on the now is like, man, I paid my dues when I started acting. I paid my dues when I done stand-up. 
paying my dues when I'd done hosting. Eventually, I got into so many industries and I was like, you know what paying your dues is? It's suffering so that the people in that industry respect you enough. But I'd done it so... In comedy, there was all these people, who's this sweet cunt? I think so you can come in here and just start. And then you pay your dues and do that. And see all the people that were moaning at you to pay your dues? They don't do it anymore. They've left the industry. So you spent so long trying to make these people feel comfortable. Oh, can I get in your club yet? Fuck that, man. Mm-hmm. Anything that I'm doing now, I'm doing because I love it. Mm-hmm. Because I've got all these skills and experience, these years behind me. And if I come in, I'm putting my all into something. I'm no there to impress MD anymore. I'm no there to kiss rings. Oh, are you okay? Can I get a, can I get a wee shot? No, fuck you. I'm doing my thing. You do your thing. Let's do it together. Let's make something beautiful. But name I'll running about being like, oh, please. Yeah. Nah, nah, fuck that. It's people pleasing and all, and it's like, oh, desperate. And that's it. But you don't realise you're doing it because you think, right, I need to do this in order to propel myself further in this industry. But it's all fucking gatekeepers. Right. It's all gatekeepers that want you to like, jump through these hoops so they can go, ah, you know what, you're all right. It's like hanging out with the young team and not getting accepted until you smash a window. <laughs> Are you can a half bottle? Are you steal something at a shop? Are you going, yeah. going, going steal his sweeties? And then, ah, oh, you man's bold for it, he's up for it, and mm-hmm. it's that exit. That external validation, it always goes back to it because mm. I can relate to it because it was me for well, so many Same. years of my life. And sometimes I need to catch myself. Go, oh, ah, no, wait, this isn't right. Am I mm. doing this for the right reasons? Yeah. It goes back to that gut feeling. Yeah, that, so that's it. That's get that sense of connection to it, that real deep sense of, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this. Mm. And if I'm ending that a day now, if that isn't there, we need to patch it. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't matter what it is, we just need to patch it. Aye. But we need to get that sense of connection. Aye, that's exactly like being connected to yourself. Mm, I think that's the biggest one. I think it's really interesting how you geeing up intoxicants and me taking a different kind of intoxicants led us to the same place. Aye. I like the idea that like you've found your openness to life and your ability to be yourself and I went a different way but we ended up in a similar my place. And of course this isn't the end point. Mm-hmm. Never to always very big on making sure people know that it's no done. Nothing's finished. Nah, as it fucks the but beginning. It's very, very start. Very, very start. But there's a million different ways to do it and one way is right for somebody and one way isn't right for somebody. Ah, that's nah, it's totally right. That's totally right. It's just finding your path. But as you mm-hmm. say, it's like I wouldn't encourage people to try this in a drug sense, mm. but life's about experimenting and mm. it's about experience. It's about trying things. Like as we talked about earlier, it's like if you've got an inkling, you mm. might like something. I might be into acting. Go to an acting class. 100%. You're either going to love it or you're not. Then you're going to know. Mm. But there's nothing worse than that feeling of what if. Because you're going to mm. experience that no matter. Like For years, I'd done boxing when I was mm. like 15. In fact, I'd done it for like a year. Then I went away for it and I always thought, I was like, I wonder where I'd be now if I still done it. Mm. Now that I'm doing it again, I love it, it's great, but I'm like that. I'm probably glad I never pursued like, a career in it because mm. I don't like getting punched in the head that much. Fair. It's all right doing it the now for like, mm. obviously TikTok and that kind mm. of thing. I do enjoy it and I do enjoy, enjoy the training. It's it, a big but, challenge. But as a career, nah, maybe no. So mm. I'm kind of glad, but had I not went back into mm. it, you I would have never have found out. That's my singing. That's singing for me. I would love to be in the hydro, so do it, and I'm like, ah! <laughs> and the whole crowd's like, ah! Back to me. I'm not willing to put the work in. I'm not willing to learn the skills. I'm not willing to go day wee gigs and pubs. I'm not willing to do the guitar. I'll fuck about with it now and again. And if I get the chance to go in the hydro and go, I will, but I'm no willing to do I'm no willing to pay my juice. I'm not even willing to start in the music industry. Mm-hmm. But I'll fuck about and do a wee rap gig here and there. Why not, man? Yeah. You might find yourself accidentally falling but, into it sometimes. Absolutely. And if it feels Darn. right, it'll feel right. Ah, but back in the day, I was like, I'd finally be happy if I was a singer. And then I'd done like one or two things on stage where I was like, ah! and I was like, nah, this isn't it. No, yet, mm-hmm. at the very least. Aye, maybe getting so. on with the music. Getting on with it, I'm actually recording an album. Oh, class. Well, uh, so that's the thing, see, this, this mighty setup that you can see, that mm. nobody else can see. So I've realised I've always had uh, the equipment to date or, mm. but I, I don't know why. I just, I started, I've recorded a couple of my own things myself, but I, I recently just got this inkling to record much stuff for scratch. And the reason for this album, right, I just, I want to create something from start to finish mm-hmm. that's all me. I play all the instruments, I mix it all, mm-hmm. I write all the songs, I just create this body of work. Wow, you're like Ben Folds. Aye, and it's like that thing, It's I've got no deadline on it, I don't give a fuck what people think it when mm-hmm. it comes out, it's just going to be my full heart and soul into this this piece of art. Mm-hmm. It's like, so I've done about five tunes and it's like, it's plus it's a learning process as well mm-hmm. because I'm teaching myself how to actually use the software, to just try new things, experiment. Mm-hmm. Experiment in that sense where I'm I'm not doing it to like in a sense where right this needs to sound like this so mm. it'll do well so people will like it. It's I'm, I'm doing it. Will this work? I'll try it, mm. and I'm really enjoying the experience. So that's yes. kind of where I'm at now. I've not released anything because I'm kind of at that that stage. I've got my camera in that there as well. Mm. I wish I had 
I was able to clone myself mm. so I could film myself because I need to leave some the filming to somebody else if I'm going to be in it. Yeah. And it's kind of brutal a bit times because you're like, right, and watching it back and you're like, hmm, it's yeah. really it's the best it is. But this is why you need that team, man. This that's is exactly why you need that, that, that's where the next Don't get me wrong, I'll get people that can help us out in that mm. kind of thing, but I think I need to surrender control. Yeah. Because I'm, the, I'm yeah. that way, I've, I've built it all myself and I'm, I'm maintaining it all mm. myself. It's kind of. Like when I talk about editing the podcast, I've met some great editors over mm -hmm. the time that are probably much better editors than me. Mm -hmm. When it comes to this podcast, I'm a better editor. Because you know it. Because you I know it. it. And it's the thing is, mm -hmm. I'll sit for eight hours mm -hmm. working on one clip or working on a podcast where these people would give up because yeah. it's no their baby. No, it's good enough. It's I'll mm -hmm. wipe this baby's ass. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll pick up, I'll clean the mud off it. No, I mean, mean, I'll feed this baby. Pass I'll go and work extra mm -hmm. hours to put food in this baby's mouth mm -hmm. because it's mine. Fair. Whereas other people might put it up for adoption. Mm -hmm. So, which is fine. I understand that, but as I say, man, like, we're, not, we're still young. Yeah. We're, we're still good. young. There's we're plenty of life still to happen. I realise well, I'm, I'm 31. If I live to 70, I've got my full life plus an extra nine years mm -hmm. left. Things are going to happen how they happen. And I did hear, I've heard multiple times for different sources that your late 20s, early 30s, where well, you're just figuring it out, uh -huh. where you're hanging about with people trying to figure it out is the best time. Because once you've figured it out, it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and that's fine. But the figuring out part, there's a joy in it, there's a spark in it that is a buzz. And what kind of, I'm eager a bit to get it done. I'm like, I want this all figured out. No. But then I know once I've got it figured out, I'll be looking back going, oh God, nah, figuring out was it's the good the part. Journey. It was it's the, the journey. Part. I always think, who the fuck's that? <laughs> I'm not expecting it. It's the journey of it, man. It's no the... way, are you ignoring that? Ah, you can idea. just ignore a buzzer. People fucking buzz me all the time just uh, to get in the clothes. Okay, fair, fair, fair. Uh, if I'm not expect, I've not ordered that. No. Nah, nah, fuck it off. Leave it at the door. <laughs> but the thing is, it's like, it's that figuring out part, it's the journey. It's the process. See, when I talk about like making this album, mm. I want to hear how it's finished. I want to hear mm. like if I'm working in a song, a lot of songs I'm just getting an idea and I'm going down and I'm recording it and then I'm building it mm -hmm. for there. So sometimes I'm like, ah, I'm stuck on a certain lyric mm -hmm. or a certain arrangement in the song. I'm like, ah, I just want to hear how this is going to sound. Yeah. I just want to know. But it's the figuring it out mm -hmm. when you listen back and like, ah, that's it. It's just if I could, and plus as well, sometimes if I use like, you can use this as a metaphor, mm -hmm. right? So if I've got a song with a certain lyric and the lyrics are missing, it's just no feeling mm -hmm. right. If I was to get handed a completed version of that song, mm -hmm. I don't think it would make sense to me. Aye, because but, I need to go through the aye, discovery. Yeah. I need to go through the experience to order to get the lyrics mm -hmm. that make sense at that time. So by the time I've completed the project, that yeah. ah, makes sense. Go but if I, would say, if I was to hear this album and it was finished, mm -hmm. I'd probably hear it and just no get it. Aye. Because I've no discovered what to put in it. Does that I, make sense? I hear you. I think it's yeah. like, and like painting terms, it's like if you gave me a painting and you showed me it, I'd be like, that's great. But gone through mixing the red and mixing the blue and actually a wee bit of purple that was already on the palette has spilt in uh -huh. And oh, that's how I get that colour. Yeah, the own. And you know all that process, but if you just seen the finished painting, you wouldn't even see the purple. You just see like the whole gradient. It's like when you look at life, you look at life like right now, it's like trying to figure it all out, but when you look back when you're elderly mm. and you're reflecting on life, you go, that had to happen mm -hmm. for this to happen. Mm -hmm. It's at the time when you go through hard experiences, mm -hmm. whether it's a breakup or a tragic time in your life, and, mm -hmm. and it just, as you say, there's confusion, it doesn't make sense. But when you look back, like some of the worst things that happened to you could be also your biggest blessings. You're mm -hmm. like, ah, right, that had to happen mm -hmm. for this. Say, you lost a job, you became homeless, whatever happened, that had to happen mm -hmm. for me to reach that point. If mm -hmm. that didn't, like if I, Talking about being in the jail. Mm -hmm. If I didn't go to jail, would I have picked up the guitar? Mm. If I didn't pick up the guitar, would I have led on to doing a podcast? Mm -hmm. Would I be making music? It's mm -hmm. like, where would my life be if that one event? Not to yeah. say, I'm grateful for the experience as much as I'm, I'm regretful for the mm -hmm. people who get hurt. Mm -hmm. But at the same time as well, I would never change it. Mm -hmm. But that took me a long time to get to that realisation. I think it takes time to filter through and process it's the, time. the That's traumatic exactly stuff. It. Exactly, and it's, it's time, so it's like, Enjoy the process, enjoy mm. the journey, because when you look at, if you're like, look at Tyson Fury, like, mm. fought for all his life to become heavyweight champion of the world, and the minute he won, he became depressed. Yeah. Because it was the journey. Ronda Rousey, lead. similar thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's leading up to it, it's mm. like the, the actual event that lasts, enjoying the moment, mm. because some, the moment will be done before you know mm. it, then you need to move on to the next mountain. When yeah. you climb a mountain, you need to focus on the next mountain, because so, the way down's a lot more depressing than the way up. So something I've been using for that is, um, the after is the main 
So, like, for example, for my show I'm doing in March, it's going to be Easter Sunday. We've got a day of the big show, but the show isn't the main event. The main event is going for dinner with my family and my partner after it. So that's what I'm really working towards. I'm going to do the show, of course, and put all the work and the effort in, but goes good, goes bad, doesn't matter. No such thing as good and bad, there's only art. The main thing is going to be that dinner. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in that dinner, I'll be able to go, ah, this is what we were working towards. So trying to find the thing that follies after the thing. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm trying to put that into practice and it feels a lot better because when it was the show that was the main thing, it was get it good, get it good, get it good. But as soon as there was another thing, it was like, oh yeah, that's what I really, actually really enjoy is uh, feeling a connection and love and fulfillment and peace and satisfaction. And I can get all that after the show mm -hmm. with the people that I love around about me as right. opposed to being on stage in that moment. I'll get in the moment. I promise I'll get it. You might not. You could, you could enjoy both though mm -hmm. if you enjoy it in the moment because you think uh, when you're having the meal with your family, if you're thinking it after, mm -hmm. when you're in the moment with your family, mm -hmm. what are you thinking about after? I've got to be thinking about the show 100%. Exactly. So it's like, and it's like, it's hard to appreciate the moment, whereas I realised that when I was on stage, I was I was I was I was, I was doing a gig and it was mm. a while ago. In that way, see, I had the nerves. I just wanted to finish the gig so I mm. could see I've done that gig. Mm. And then I was well, halfway through the tune, I was like, ah, just enjoy the moment. Mm, be that, present. Because you wanted to do this, because mm. when you finish the gig, you're gonna be like, ah, oh, I want to do another gig. Yeah. It's like enjoy the moment and when you're there, and just uh, no matter how it goes, just enjoy it for your own you've just uh, broke gratification. You broke me through there, man. I've realised the reason that I was focusing so much on the dinner is was the idea that I was gonna do badly during the show. So I was trying to deflect and be like, the show does not actually matter to me. I'm focused on the dinner. Yeah. Wow, that's so funny, man. So funny you can believe something and then in an instant switch it ah it's because yeah. I've experienced the same thing so mm. I and just quite recently like, as I say when I was in London I, I keep catching myself doing it like, mm. I can't like, when I had that podcast I was fanning about London for about mm. two days before it and I was just kicking about mm. and I was like I can't wait to do this podcast mm. and get it done and then and then I'll be sitting in the train and I'll be back in Glasgow and I'll be like but wait but when I'm back in Glasgow I'm going to be reminiscing about London the, aye. So and being able to roam about and I'm like ah, so I don't know when mm. I'm going to be back here be present in get the moment the awareness. and just see when you enjoy the moment for what it is mm. rather than thinking look right now I could be thinking about oh, I can't wait to have dinner mm. but then when I have dinner I'll be like ah, that's a good podcast mm. see if I enjoy the moment, the now, I'll enjoy the podcast mm. and the dinner yeah. as they happen rather than been thinking, oh, that was a good podcast and I can't wait for my dinner because yeah. you're never, Always you're never fully time. settled mm. in the moment. Yeah, I heard that for Ram Dass, who's a spiritual guy that I like, look up Ram Dass, uh, Richard Alpert, he's good stuff. But he had, he's like, we wake up and then we get the coffee and then after the coffee, we brush our teeth and then after we brush our teeth, we get a cigarette and then after the cigarette, we get a can of juice and then after the can of juice, we have a bit of toast and then we go and we visit a friend and then after a friend, we go to work and then once we finish work, we get our dinner and then after after dinner we do the dishes and then after we do the dishes we have another cigarette and then we have a can of juice and then we go to bed because we're tired and then we sleep and we wake up and we've slept too much and then on and on just these wee bits wee dunts of stuff on oh, no, on no. and the Gita I actually said it was the selfish desire is the enemy of the wise you need to fight with all your might to get rid of selfish desire so that bit of your brain that's like I need this I need that I need to be here I need to be doing that that's the that's endless that's endless. You're never going to satiate it. What you need to do is disconnect from it and realise that senses are only senses. Hunger is only hunger. Feelings are only feelings. And then one above, thoughts are only thoughts. And then one above, intellect is only intellect. And then you get to the one bigness. And that's the real one. There's no the senses and the stuff and the day and the achieving or even the being. It's not even being human. It's one above that. And that's the everything. If we can get to the everything, we feel the peace. But the senses will pop back up. I need a piss. Ah! And then thoughts will pop up. Ah, it's too warm in here. And then we'll on and on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to do as much as I can to like, I think just getting wee moments of connection to that takes the power away for the senses and the thoughts. Aye. And something I'd really needed recently was the idea that a thought is just a thought. Because my thoughts were beating me down, man. They were getting me. They would have me in this loop where I'd think something and I'd feel bad about it and I'd try not to think it and I'd push it away. I think it sounds reminiscent to OCD for what I've heard. Mm. Um, I just couldn't stop thinking about it and then having somebody say to me, nah, it's all right. A thought is just a thought. You mm. can think it and realise it's just a thought. It gave me that ability to disconnect, which has brought so much happiness and so much peace into my life mm -hmm. that wasn't there previously. So right. I do want to share that to anybody that's listening that's struggling with the rough thoughts. It's just a thought. Aye. You're not your thoughts. Mm. And that's what meditation teaches you. It teaches you to be present. Mm. Like, like thoughts will come. Mm. You can't stop thoughts. And I think that's the thing. It's a control thing. Control stems with fear. 
you want to try and control it. You want mm. to stop these thoughts. But the more you try and stop a thought, the mm. more you think it. Mm -hmm. You can't Bounds stop it. it. So, and that's when it comes back to surrendering. Mm. Acceptance, surrender, all these words. It's like you accept it. Mm -hmm. Thoughts are thoughts. They're mm -hmm. going to come. It's not the making of mm -hmm. me. It's not the definition of me. A bad thought will come. Mm -hmm. A good thought will come. That's just the way it is. It right doesn't me. define me. It doesn't mm -hmm. make me a bad person or mm -hmm. anything, man. It's just let it come and see once you do that and just mm -hmm. accept the moment and accept yourself, man. It's like you truly uncover the, the, the key to life. Yeah, I think so, man. I think being present is something I realised at a very young age. I was like, all you need to do is be present. And then spent about 10 years no being able to do it but it's the practice as I, I, it's a lifelong practice yeah, it was a 75 to the tune and I'd just read Eckhart Tolle The Power of Now and I was just looking on the bus and I was like look at these trees we're alive wow I was like oh this is amazing was, I'm going to be like this forever and then right back in it, whoop, yeah, but see if you could see the amount of the depression pain suffering that I went into after that moment You were, but for, in that second I thought this is it, I've found it. And it, the whole dance in my life has been a constant in and out mm -hmm. of that presence. And the worse that things go, the harder it was to be present. But that's one thing that the Aya did, was allow me not only presence, but uh, joy, mere joy in the moment. You don't, I don't need to do anything. Before the new, if I was sitting here, I'd be like, oh, can they see my belly on the podcast? I better... S like that, and I'm already thinking about ways that are going to make me unhappy in the future. And so, oh, look, my shoulders are in my ears, man. But now I can just... Ah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> <laughs> and that's it the present is a gift and your presence is a gift to me but I'm going to wind the podcast on mate it's been an absolute like, eye opening mm. spiritual affair just like every single one is it's like I come away having learned man. Mm. I hope you feel the same and mate, hopefully absolutely. the audience has felt the same man no I hope so man I hope whatever energy I felt in these ceremonies I hope you've got even just a wee a wee taste man a Aye. wee sliver of that and if it feels like plant medicine is something you want to pursue do your research and keep yourself safe don't do what anybody tells you Go with your instincts. Make sure you're keeping yourself safe. And Fivo, thank you for having me on, man. It's an absolute, an absolute pleasure, fucking mate. Pleasure to do this. Uh, anything you want to promote to the camera just before we go? Obviously, you've got your show on the 31st of March. If you want to just remind the, yeah. the listeners where you're going to be. Let me go. Let me go. On art first, let me say on art. And I really want to put this down. Stop thinking that being a good drawer makes you good or bad at art. There is no good or bad art. There is only art. Do it to heal yourself. Don't do it to be good at it. That is the trap that everybody's put it in. Don't let it be that. Just take a pen, take a pencil, take some paint, and do something. And it doesn't matter if it's good or it's bad, because there's no such thing. It's just art. Outside of that. On the 31st of March at Blackfriars in Merchant City, I am gonna be blasting off with my stand-up solo debut Space Cadet. One hour of Terry and Boy lifestyle stories, psychedelic journeys and plant medicine experiences compacted into a 60-minute extravaganza that you can see off of the low, low price of £10 plus the £1 that sea tickets charge you. I don't have anything to do with that. I'm sorry about it, but I only see a wee bit here. Come down and get your tickets by typing in Space Cadet Glasgow International Comedy Festival or Space Cadet Terry and Boyd or go and find Terry and Boyd on socials and coming down to the show. It's going to be a highly an event. I'm going to use all my resources that I've gained in 20 years of acting, stand up comedy music hosting i'm putting them all into this show so that i can help bring that audience up to the big light in the sky to give them a wee light in their eyes come down and see space cadet on the 31st of march at blackfriars i'll be there and a big shout out to five for having me on today thank you thank you pleasure's all mine tarry and boy people like subscribe and don't get wide catches yeah